All right, everybody, thanks for watching the program tonight. It is an unexpected program, but we are here for a debate. And I just want to say that we originally, uh, Tommy McMurtry here we're, and I were going to debate a different topic on a different channel, Donnie's channel, which most people that watch my programs know who he is, Standing for Truth YouTube channel. He's had some uh, uh, tragic circumstances come up, and so we had to uh, cancel that one. It will be rescheduled on Donnie's channel. And uh, so we are going to do this, this debate. Now, I did advertise this uh, at the first as the same topic as that one, Once Saved, Always Saved. But we decided, since we're rescheduling the one on Donnie's channel, we're going to do a different one here. So tonight's topic on this debate is Lordship salva Salvation versus Free Grace. And we got Turretin Fan here to come in and moderate for us. This is the second time he's helped me out. He's filled in as an opponent of mine on a previous debate. So I owe him two favors. So, but uh, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves and say what they want about themselves and where you can see more of them. And, uh, and then we'll start talking about the debate more, but Tommy, you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes. I'm pastor Tommy McMurtry. I pastor the Liberty Baptist church in rock falls been pastoring here for about 12 and a half years and uh, been in the ministry uh, my entire adult life grew up in a pastor's home and uh, I've got a wife and eight kids and enjoying life and uh, enjoy, of course, theology and love talking about different things. And I like debates, not so much for debating and getting in arguments, but I do think there's a lot to be gained from healthy dialogue. And I, uh, it's my desire to communicate clearly and to be as clear as I possibly can in my doctrine. And I want to know where the real disagreements are at. And that's why I like doing these things so I can, uh, we can ultimately get to the truth. And so I'm excited to be here tonight. All right. And turrets and fan, once again, thanks for filling in on short notice. And uh, what do you want to tell people about you? Uh, reformed blogger and YouTuber, uh, actively involved in debate, rarely as moderator. In fact, I think this might be my first YouTube moderation. So please have patience with me in my uh, in my failings as a moderator, which I very well may make, but I'll do my best. All right. Well, I'm going to go over the uh, format, which will be uh, two 10-minute openings for uh, Tommy and I. And then there will be two 15-minute rebuttals, which is a little unusual. But I do think that uh, a long rebuttal is necessary, but that's just me, And but they were okay with that. And then we'll have a cross-examination. <clears throat> now it'll be 10 minutes, one person, alternate 10 minutes, the other, and then it'll go back 10 minutes, and then another 10 minutes for the person. Total of 40 minutes. Then there will be five-minute uh, closings. And then at that point, we'll have uh, audience Q&A, and uh, Turton and Fan will be picking questions. So get questions ready, and hopefully we'll get a lot of people but I just want to say once again about Donnie, uh, I didn't say this, but, you know, keep him and his family in your prayers. Uh, so, but uh, I guess it is time to begin, and we've agreed for me to go first. So I'm going to hand it over to Turton Fan from here on out. Okay, okay. You are up first representing the Lordship position, and you have 10 minutes. I will start the timer when you start all right. Well, I do want to say thanks to Tommy for doing the debate, especially in uh, short notice topic and this kind of thing here and changing channels. But he's willing to do it. I appreciate a man who likes debates. I know he does. Nothing I'm going to say here is personal uh, or animosity towards him, but uh, it is for the sake of truth. And that's what we're here to do. And I'm going to press it when it needs to be pressed. But so I do appreciate him. Now, uh, let me say that I am representing the Lordship salvation here. Now, I don't usually use the term except for in a debate or when I need to tell somebody that I do hold the view because it's not always represented in the way that I would represent it or what I believe. See, my view is not that we make Jesus Lord. I know it's critiqued sometimes that way. You know, well, you don't make Jesus Lord. God has made him Lord. Now, that I agree with 100%. He is Lord. He is objectively Lord. The Father has made him Lord. He has all authority in heaven and earth. 
But for me, Lordship salvation is, and what I believe the Bible teaches, that we must subjectively surrender to his Lordship to be saved. That there is no salvation if one has not surrendered in obedience to the Lordship of Christ. And, necessarily, therefore, repentance. Uh, you know, our repentance from sin. And let me define that. Repentance from sin doesn't mean you make a list of every sin you've ever committed and you start uh, acknowledging it and changing. No, a repentance from sin, I mean a change of mind towards sin in general. You were the servant of sin, the servant of yourself. You're your own king. And you've had a change of mind about living in sin, rebellion, and you want to now serve the Lord Jesus. If that hasn't happened, the person isn't saved. That's what I mean by lordship salvation. So uh, let's start here then, because I think, I think this is really a matter of faith. And we'll start here. This is an obvious case. This is what usually comes up, Acts chapter 16. Now you have Paul here. He's talking to a Gentile jailer. And most people are familiar with the story. The jailer asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is Acts 16.30. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. But what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? It is to believe in the Lord Jesus. It, so salvation, according to Paul here, is to, is to know and believe that Jesus is Lord. That's why it's believe in the Lord Jesus. Now, you know, that's what that's what belief is in the Bible. It's to take somebody at their word and trust they are who they say they are and to trust their words. Now, Jesus throughout the Bible, through the Gospels and through the teachings of the apostles and the New Testament writers, claims to be Lord. And he does say, submit to him. And he does usher commands. So, the question has to be asked, if you believe Jesus for what he says, and since salvation is through faith, after all, if you do believe Jesus, but you have not surrendered, then the question has to be asked, well, do you really believe as you just claimed? Now, you claim to believe, it's supposedly that you believed, but if, you aren't, if you're not submitting to him, then do you really believe he's Lord? I mean, if you, if you trust Jesus for what he says, and he says, I'm your Lord, I have a rightful authority over you, but you do not submit, then you're not trusting him. You see, to trust somebody is to take them at their word. But since Jesus has never given words where he's promised to save people who are in active rebellion, and we're not talking about sinless perfection. Nobody's, nobody's sinless. But the Bible describes his people very frequently throughout the Bible as uh, obedient and faithful, like Zechariah and Elizabeth. John the Baptist's parents are called blameless righteous. Well, it doesn't mean they're sinless because nobody's sinless. What it means is they're not living in rebellion. And since Jesus says he has rightful authority o over everybody, and since he never promised to save those who are in rebellion, never once do you have that, then to be in rebellion means you're not trusting in him. Because he never said that he would save active rebels. People who used to be rebels, yes, he saves those. But he never promised to save those who continue in the rebellion. He never promised to save former believers. So to live in such a way shows that you're not trusting in him since you never said anything. It's the same thing, uh, never said anything like that. In Romans 10, it's the same thing. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, or as some translations will say, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be you will be saved. So the idea is the confession with the mouth is that you've acknowledged from your heart, through your mouth, this truth that Jesus is Lord, of the Lord Jesus once again. But if you don't, if you don't repent and serve him, if you continue in your rebellion, then you haven't really believed in the Lord. You know, this this actually is something Jesus himself talks about in Matthew 7. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That's Matthew 7 and 21. Now, Jesus is not talking about a work salvation. He's not talking about meriting through your works or obedient salvation. He's talking about the characteristics of those who do enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's those 
not just who say, Lord, Lord, but who do the will. So you can claim one thing, but if you're not actually doing the will of the Father, then what you've claimed is meaningless. That's the whole point. And I believe that's what free grace is, that you can be saved while in rebellion. You can be saved without surrendering, your, surrendering yourself to the authority of Jesus. That Jesus says in the same the parallel account in Luke, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Yeah, because it's meaningless. Because you're not really trusting in him, because he never said that he will save those, or give eternal life to those who are former believers, or those who continue in rebellion, or have not repented. And that, that's what this debate is about. But... Uh, Free grace position, and of course, Tommy will he'll speak for himself on his version of that. But in general, I say that free grace says exactly the opposite of what we're hearing here from the scriptures. And you know, I've I've made this comparison that faith and fruit or righteousness is like fire and light. Where there is fire, there necessarily will be light. And to different degrees of faith, different degrees of light, of course, or rather fire and light. But so where there's faith, there's going to be a production of righteousness, obedience, fruit, repentance. It goes hand in hand. That's the way the Bible presents faith. You know, it says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, uh, this is verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. Now it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. He obeyed by faith. So, obedience comes from faith. And that's what we see here. It never would have said he had faith if he was disobedient. It never says by faith someone disobeyed. And, uh, but that's, that's what we, that's what we're going to have from free grace in general. You know, it, Jesus said that uh, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Tommy, like me, is not a dispensationalist. And in Matthew chapter 19, in at least three, maybe four different ways, Jesus paralleled eternal life with entering the kingdom. Eternal life, uh, those who are saved, salvation, as the disciples asked there in Matthew 19, to enter the kingdom is to be saved. But you don't enter the kingdom if you're not doing the will of the Father. And my big question for uh, Tommy throughout the debate, now he's not going to have any obligation to respond to me in his opening, but at some point in the debate, I'd like for him to tell everybody why God would save anybody who has yet to repent, who has not made their surrender to Christ. Well, why would God save anybody who hasn't done that? Why would he save anybody, and you can call it faith, but hasn't turned their life around because all from the beginning of the Bible, God has been looking for people to serve and follow him. Now, he never gets sinlessness, but what he gets is service. As flawed as we are, there's a difference between a rebel or someone who isn't surrendering to him, someone who's still serving themselves, and someone who, through faith, presses on in their, in their service. That's what he's always sought for. So if he's going to save somebody who has yet to repent, yet to bow the knee to Jesus, though they may claim faith, though they may claim they believe, they may claim he's Lord, but haven't actually surrendered, why would God save them? What does he get out of it? Because salvation is ultimately for him. All right. Thanks for your timely 10-minute opening. And now, uh, Tommy, it's your uh, your turn for 10 minutes to present the free grace side. Let's see if I can do this solo correctly. That's not the one. Let's try it again. <laughs> uh, third, third time's the charm. Let's see. Okay. All right. Well, AK, make sure you uh keep asking me that question because i will definitely definitely get to that it's a great question but for my opening statement um first thing i want to make sure that we do is that we are on the same page when it comes to what lordship salvation means and free grace you gave uh some of your definition of what it is and i'll kind of share my thoughts on it you can let me know 
because I don't want us talking past each other during this debate. But when we look at Romans 5.15, which is where I want to start, I want us to emphasize something that Paul is clearly trying to emphasize to the point of almost extreme repetition and extreme emphasis. This passage is one of the clearest passages, I think, that illustrates everything that I believe about salvation. And so in Romans 5.15, he says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it were by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall receive or shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men on justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The obedience of one, not our obedience, Christ's obedience. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What's that all about? The law makes us guilty of more things, but we must understand that guilt in order to see our need for salvation. So in reality, the more guilty we are, the more likely we are to realize that we need a Savior and we can believe on Christ and be saved. And because, again, it's not about our obedience. It's only about the obedience of one that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So Romans 5, we see the words grace over and over again, free gift, free free gift. And so when I think about free grace, I think that's a great way to describe salvation. Salvation is truly free. Grace is truly free. It is about the obedience of one, not our obedience. And the reality is if it isn't free, then it's not even grace. It's not free now, but you got to pay later, which is what uh, people are basically saying, where if you don't surrender your life to the Lord or if you never follow him, then you obviously never truly got saved. No, it is it is completely free. You don't have to ever pay him back, not for your salvation. Grace is unmerited favor. And as soon as you base someone's salvation, on someone's merit, it immediately ceases to be about grace. And so I'm not quick to accept labels, especially when they don't have a clear definition. But um, if we look at free grace, according to Wikipedia, I'll read this to you. I would definitely subscribe to this. And free grace theology is a Christian soteriological view, which holds that the only condition of salvation is faith, excluding good works and perseverance holding to eternal security. Free grace advocates believe that good works are not the condition to merit, as with Catholics, to maintain, as with Arminians, or to prove, as with most Calvinists, salvation, but rather are part of discipleship and the basis for receiving eternal rewards. Unlike in hypergrace, this soteriological view distinguishes between salvation and discipleship the call to believe in Christ as Savior and to receive the gift of eternal life and on the call to follow Christ and become a, an obedient disciple, respectively. Free grace theologians emphasize the absolute freeness of salvation and the possibility of full assurance that is not grounded upon personal performance. Norman Geisler has divided this view into a, a moderate form and a more radical form the moderate form being associated with Charles Riley and the more strong from Zane Hodges. And I don't know these men. I don't know what they believe, but I will say, according to the de that definition, I agree. Now, it says here, the modern form of free grace theology has its roots in the soteriology of formulated by many dispensational theologians. Many free grace people are also dispensationalists. And let me just say, I reject dispensationalism. I do not believe for one second 
that dispensationalism is needed to teach free grace. And sadly, many people who feel like they must emphasize dispensationalism to teach free grace often believe that in other dispensations, works might have been a part of salvation or eternal security was not always a part of salvation. I reject that. I believe salvation has always been by grace through faith without works. I believe it has always been eternal. I believe it's always been once saved, always saved. And so I can say with confidence, though, I am a free grace guy, according to this definition. Now, when it comes to lordship salvation, you know, it has many problems for many reasons. The one thing that it does for sure is it lowers the standard of God's law. And in reality, biblically, it throws the law out. And understand, for you to hold to any version of lordship salvation, I think scripturally, we're showing that you are literally lowering God's standard. You are throwing out the holy law of God. Free grace, to me, is the only uh, soteriology that actually affirms all the law of God and sees it as good and as authority over us. And that's been, in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. And we've already seen mention our discipleship, our obedience. No, we declare his obedience. We declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the, also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. This is why free grace is the only soteriology that affirms all the law of God, because of the fact we recognize it is authoritative. We do recognize that Jesus is Lord and that the law is good and that we are guilty. We accept the condemnation that comes from disobedience to the law of God, and that is death. That is the wages of sin. And we would not do a just a blasphemy and a disservice to the law of God by acting like we in some way are obedient to the law of God because you don't just get to pick and choose. It's an all or nothing deal. And the fact that we are sinners means we are guilty of all of the law. And so what we have done, though, Jesus Christ came and he paid for our sins. His grace has abounded. And even though that law just made us exceeding more sinful, where, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we believe that he paid for all of our sins. And we believe that the, the gift of salvation is, in fact, a free gift. And we accept it with joy. And we, uh, when we call on him for salvation, we believe he will save us. He will keep us eternally saved. And it's my desire, you know, that goodness of God is what's led me to my poor, pathetic version of repentance of sins. But I would never claim to have successfully repented of my sins. For me to claim to have repented of my sins would be to throw out the law. Sorry, one, one minute. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. With okay, that's okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, any, so I find it offensive when people say that they have repented of their sins or they need to repent of their sins. You, it is the ultimate hypocrisy to think that one has done that, can do that, because in the free grace world, we recognize the law of God and we see it as good 
and we see ourselves as guilty, we know better than to claim that we are in any way, shape, or form on our best day keeping the law of God. We recognize our guilt that we have every day, and we're thankful for the grace that abounds in our life and that we are uh, justified, not by our works, but because Jesus is just. And so we declare his righteousness, not our own. All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties from my side. Uh, no excuses. I, it's just, I apologize. No, that's all right. I think you're doing just fine. Set my timer. So the, we've come through the opening statements. Now we're coming to the rebuttal portion, 15 minute speeches for each side. The audience, I'm looking for audience questions for the audience Q and A already. So feel free to start dropping them in there in the chat and I'll try to save them for the audience Q&A section. Uh, since this is, there's not super chats, if you have a question, you very well might get an answer. So just some encouragement to those who are listening along. And I will start your timer uh, when you get started. All right, 15. Oh. I appreciate that from Tommy. Uh, I got to say, though, I don't think he understood most of what I did say in my opening. You know, at the beginning there, Tommy mentioned many things about, uh, he read from Romans 5, talked about grace, a free gift. He emphasized, well, both grace, but he, and he really emphasized that it's free, free gift. And he said it's not this pay later kind of thing. You know, I agree with all that. I, I never said it wasn't, I never said we pay for anything. You see, I think what is happening is Tommy is conflating free with unconditional. And if so, it had to be inconsistent because he himself believes a person must believe. Well, that makes it conditional. And so by the fact that he acknowledges one must believe, at least at some point, whether he repents or not, I mean, he we, we've heard what he believes about it. But since you have to believe, and since Tommy believes that a person must have faith to be justified, that makes it conditional, which also shows that Tommy acknowledges the difference between something being unconditional and it being free. A thing can be free. doesn't mean it's unconditional. Well, so we both actually agree on this. I don't believe that it's anything but a free gift. That I, and as a matter of fact, I emphasize that. So salvation is by grace, absolutely. It's unmerited. Uh, it is always unmerited. We can never merit it. Nobody is ever sinless. So we're not disagreeing on that. That is not the point of disagreement. I believe in a free gift. It is conditional. It is conditional on faith. Now, this is what I think was missed in my opening. Now, I know he's not responding to my opening. Now, I get that. But what I am saying is he doesn't understand what I did show in my opening, even though he wasn't responding to it, because none of that is what he's debating at all in this debate. I believe it's free, but it's not unconditional. And the point that I was making is since it is conditioned on faith, what well, you have to understand that to believe in Jesus means you trust him for who he is and for what he says. Acts 16, once again, Romans 10, believe in the Lord Jesus. Now, if he's really Lord and you believe that, you're going to turn and surrender to him. If you haven't, then you don't really believe Jesus, who says, I am your Lord, you must submit to me. Jesus uh, gives commands. And he says in the Gospels and through the apostles and writers of the New Testament that he has authority. And so if you're not submitting, you're not trusting in him, because he certainly never said that he's going to save those who are in active rebellion. So it wouldn't be trusting in him uh, to do so and to think so. And so uh, in, his, in the beginning, Tommy said, he mentioned when he was contrasting his view and what he disagreed with, he said, he talked about uh, the Lordship basing salvation on merit. At least he mentioned that in the beginning. Again, I was never talking about merit. You know, all those passages that I mentioned about uh, obedience or, or uh, believe in the Lord Jesus or entering the kingdom, doing the will of the Father in Matthew 7. I was, I know, In fact, I made it clear when I read from Matthew 7 that Jesus is not talking about works righteousness. He's not talking about meriting getting into the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about the, the basis for how you get in there. He's not talking about what justifies you. He's simply talking about the necessary characteristics of those who do get in. Now, they get in through faith. 
but a natural byproduct of faith. And I never use the word automatic. I don't know why that gets thrown out. But a natural byproduct of faith, just like fire and light, is that one is going to turn and repent of their sins. And I have more to say about that in a moment. So the, the disagreement of the debate is what is really faith? Not that we are justified by faith and not works and not merit. We're not disagreeing on that. It's what is this faith biblically that we are justified through. And I've shown what the Bible talks about when it talks about faith. To believe in the Lord means believe in him for who he says he is and for what he says. And since he never says he saves active rebels, then to be a rebel means you're not really trusting in him. He never said such a thing. Now, uh, Tommy talked about, he mentioned what he heard from me, and he said, we've already heard our obedience. Well, yeah, because I talked about that from the scriptures. It was Jesus, in fact. It wasn't just AK that we heard it from. I was reading what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, when Jesus talked about doing the will of the Father, which most people don't even understand that passage, because they say, well, the problem is they're trusting in their works. That's why they're not getting accepted. Well, that might be a problem. But the reason Jesus says that they're not accepted is not because they trust in their works, although that might be the source. But the reason that Jesus gives for them not being accepted in Matthew 7 and 20 and 21 is because they're not doing the will of the Father. Now, that's what Jesus says. So it wasn't AK that was saying our obedience. It's Jesus talking about that. So, uh, you know, Tommy said that free grace, that's his position, recognizes that we are guilty. But no, I, I recognize the same thing, and in my opening, I said the same thing, and I say the same thing now. We are never sinless. But the Bible, the Bible does recognize people that are faithful. It talks about the faithful. I mean, how many times have you heard that statement from Jesus? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, he's not declaring that a servant was sinless. Elizabeth and Zechariah, once again, John the Baptist's parents were said to be faithful, blameless, uh, righteous, I believe, but they're not sinless. So that's not, so you can be righteous and you can be blameless. And the Bible recognizes that that's not a person who's sinless. It's a person who's, uh, this is their typical conduct of serving Jesus. And this is, in fact, and I get back to the real point. Uh, what the main issue is, that we are justified by faith, not merit, not by the merit of our conduct, not by our obedience, but that the faith that justifies leads to obedience. And if you don't have that, if you haven't repented of your sins, you haven't obeyed. And uh, let me read this. I said that this is what faith is to God throughout the whole Bible. This is what God cares about. And why God would ever save someone who's in active rebellion just misses what it is not understanding God, at least to the degree that we should. God doesn't want to save people active in rebellion. That means nothing to him. He gets nothing out of saving you if you're an active rebel. He gets nothing out of it. He doesn't get service. And salvation is ultimately for him. We benefit from it. It's ultimately for God. We, we are saved for his purposes. So I'd say lordship recognizes, unlike free grace, that salvation is ultimately about God. That's why obedience is necessary, not to merit salvation, but because that's what God wants, and it's about him. And this is what faith is. It, it is not a synonym with obedience. It's one leads to the other like fire and light. Now, so, you know, for example, uh, in Deuteronomy 9, when Moses was rebuking the Israelites for their past disobedience and bad behavior, he reminded them about the time God wanted them to to go into the land, the promised land, or begin to go in there and uh, conquer. And they sent spies. The spies came back and said, hey, these guys over there, they're huge. I, and they're strong. We're like grasshoppers. And the people started complaining. And God was very mad. Now it says, uh, Moses mentioning this in verse 22 and 23, he says, he's reminding them, he says, God had said, go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you, Israel, rebelled against the command of Yahweh your God, and you did not believe him, and you did not listen to his voice. Now, notice how it parallels obedience with faith. It says, you rebelled, you did not believe, and you did not listen to his voice. You see, because since God had promised victory, 
then they should have trusted him. Despite what they see and the threats that they see in the, in the strong people of the cities, they should have trusted God. They didn't, which is why they rebelled. You see, because faith goes hand in hand with service and obedience. It goes back to Adam and Eve. Eve did not eat. Now think about this. I want everybody to marinate on this. Right from the beginning of the problem, disobedience and sin, goes back to this one thing, faith. You see, why did Eve not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, at least up until the time that she did? Why, what, why did she refrain from eating? It's because she trusted God. If she told the devil, well, he said that the day you eat, you will surely die. Well, then what did the devil have to get her to do to get her to disobey and eat and start this whole problem of sin and suffering that we've been experiencing ever since? He had to get her to not trust him. He said, no, you will not die. What he's saying is don't trust him. And so when she trusted God, she refrained from eating. In other words, she obeyed God. When she stopped trusting God, she disobeyed. The problem, you see, the obedience or the disobedience is a symptom of something else, faith or the lack thereof. It goes back to that. God has always wanted this kind of faith that gets people to trust in him. And when you trust, you, you obey. So why would God ever save and bring salvation to someone actively in rebellion who has not surrendered? Why would him? What does he get out of the deal? I say deal. Of course, I'm speaking loosely here. But it doesn't serve God. It, salvation is ultimately about him, not about us. It's about us in the sense that we get saved, sure enough. But we're not just getting saved, and then that's it. God is saving us for him, a saving a people for himself. He gets nothing out of an act of rebel. Now, we all stumble. James says we stumble in many things. Nobody's sinless, but that's not the issue. There's a difference between someone who is not surrendering, someone who's serving themselves, and a Christian who's serving Jesus but stumbles. Serving Jesus gives in through weakness here and there. I think everybody should recognize that. It always seems to be a problem, but everybody should recognize the difference. And concerning repentance from sin. Now, Tommy had mentioned... Uh, and I said, what do you say? He talked about repentance of sin. He says, I, I don't ever see that. Uh, well, that's actually something the Bible talks about quite often. In Acts chapter 2, Peter told them to repent. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul was talking to the, uh, the pagans there on, in Athens, he said, God has commanded every man everywhere to repent. It's in the context of them committing idolatry. Sure, you got to repent. It's everywhere in the Bible. And when he says, I don't think anybody can do that, he said something to that effect. Sure, we can. And people do it. Elizabeth and Zechariah are said to be blameless. Well, they surely would have repented. And this is why I explained this in my opening. When we're talking about repentance of sins, I'm not talking about making a list of all your sins as if you had to remember them all. No new convert, first of all, even knows all of what he's doing, what all is a sin. He hasn't learned. I mean, he has some degree of knowledge. But we learn about these things. Repentance of sin means your attitude towards sin in general changes, that you're not going to live in sin. You're going to live for Christ. Now, you do sin from time to time. Every Christian does. And the true Christian doesn't like it, and we try to pick ourselves up by the grace and mercy of Christ and move forward. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what Peter said. Now, I realize some people might say, oh, pick ourselves up. I see, AK. That's, that's a works thing. Well, I don't think Peter agrees because he said, let us lay aside the sin that so easily besieges us. Now, I mean, this kind of thing about, well, you can't say that kind of thing because, oh, you're putting the emphasis on yourself. That's, that's stuff that people have created, but the Bible writers really don't talk that way. They acknowledge we got certain obligations to believe, for one thing. But, yeah, there is repentance, a person who says, oh, I'm going to keep sinning, cannot expect salvation, unlike what free grace tells us. But once again, I want everybody to know, this is probably the most important point. It is not really to understand God very well. Because from the beginning, God has wanted people to put their trust. And I said earlier that trust and reliance are good words, I think, at least helpful to capture what saving faith looks like. Because reliance is... It stresses the idea that when you rely on somebody, you're putting, you're having to lean 
on them. You're having to put yourselves on them. You know, if you rely, if you trust the bridge, speaking of recent news, you know, we put our trust in bridges that we cross. And the fact that we cross the bridge shows that we trust that it's going to hold us up. And ultimately, we're trusting in the engineers. Now, with humans, as we have seen, sometimes this fails. A boat may run into it and, you know, and we go plunging into the water. But we see, though, the idea that when we cross the bridge, we're trusting in the bridge. One minute. The person who doesn't trust isn't going to go across. If they trust it a little bit, they might really fearfully go across, biting their fingernails. So different degrees of faith, different degrees of conduct. But we go across the bridge because we trust. Someone who says, that bridge is going to fall. I don't trust it. They're not going to go across. That's the way that it works. It's always worked that way through the Bible. That's what God has always wanted. He doesn't get sinlessness from us. It just doesn't happen. But he does want a faith, as Paul says, that works through love. People talk about our motivation. It's not trying to save ourselves. We obey. I'm talking about obedience from the heart because we love and trust God, not because we're trying to earn our way into salvation. That can't happen. No, the faith that I'm talking about is one that comes from love, like Paul said in Galatians 5, 6. This is what true biblical faith is. This is the point of disagreement in the Bible. It shouldn't be missed. I turn it back over to Turton fan. All right. That brings us to the second rebuttal. This time Tommy's up. Let me see if I can do this correctly so that hopefully when I go to solo layout, it's, it's Tommy. I apologize about last time. See I did the same thing when I first started using this. I can't figure out how to get the windows where I want them. All righty. I'll start the timer as soon as you go. Yeah. All right. So uh, I really hope what we can do tonight, I would like for AK to define the standard for obedience and faithfulness, because I do feel like in the Lordship world, it's always kind of a mysterious, unknown thing. And so my question that I would like for you to answer at some point is, can a person know 100% sure that they are saved? And then I'd be interested in hearing how an individual can know for sure they're saved. I hope we can get to that at some point. But I do want to address some of the things you brought up. You brought up God not saving uh, rebels. Well, um, Romans 5, 6 says, for when... We were yet without strength in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man somebody even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I think we're still sinners. I think we're still ungodly. Romans 4, 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. It looks to me like all those things happen while we are still in a state of ungodliness and sinfulness. See, and I think that AK would probably agree with this. Um, I'd be interested in hearing his thoughts on it, but our flesh is always in rebellion against God. When a person is saved and when a person is born again, it's our spirit that is born. Our flesh is not regenerated. Our flesh is still sinful and in it dwells no good thing. Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So our flesh is always in a complete and total state of rebellion. But then when a person believes on Christ, their spirit is regenerated, and there's a battle now that's taken place. And if we walk in the flesh, we will fulfill the desires of the flesh. But if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh and a saved person is very capable of walking in the flesh but the reality is we didn't fix anything we didn't clean anything up and a person who establishes the law of god a person who recognizes not just the the lordship of christ but the authority of his word 
a person who recognizes that holy law of God, that every bit of it is good and every bit of it is holy, how do you convince that person that they can obey that? No, we are convinced that we cannot obey that and that our only hope is Jesus Christ. And so our flesh is always in rebellion and uh, and understand we when, when we believe on Christ, he saves us and then our spirit is what's good. So uh, yeah, he's been saying too, you know, what does God get out of it? What does God get out of saving rebels? Well, while we're yet sinners, he still loved us. Um, in Matthew 20, 27, it says, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. When I read the Bible, I see a God who looked at sinful man and loved us in our sinful state and didn't come to earth saying, let's see what I can get them to do for me. He came to earth saying, let's see what I can do for them. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became a servant. And he did that for us. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of arrogant to think that God gets something from us. Because what is the only thing that we can even do that pleases God? Well, the, what pleases God is our faith. What can the creation do for the creator? Hey, what? Nothing. Not in our sinful flesh. But yet he is pleased, we see in the scriptures, by our faith. Our, the faith is what pleases him. And the reason that our faith pleases God is because it causes God to see the son. It's no longer a mystery why God was pleased with Abel's offering. It was no longer a mystery why God was pleased by Enoch. The Bible says that hey, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What do we see in Hebrews? Right after it says he had this testimony to please God, but without faith. It is impossible to please him. These were men of faith. They believed on, they, uh, they trusted in God and that faith was counted for righteousness because faith caused them to see the son and not see us. We, we have nothing. We have nothing to offer. God is giving everything to us. We can't pay him back in some way. And God did not come to see what he could get out of his creation. No, he came and loved for us to show what he could do for us. And so here's what God gets when he saves rebels. Here's what God gets when he saves people who, in reality, are still in a fallen state. In reality, we are still sinners. We still have on the appearance of the sons of Adam. We are fallen people. And you know what God gets when he saves us? even though we're still sinful and in reality our works and our righteousness are as filthy rags, he gets all the glory. When he saves people like us, he gets all the glory. That's what it's all about. You know, because again, we're declaring his righteousness. And when we use our obedience as proof of salvation, we are using our works as justification or proof of salvation. No, he is the just and the justifier of those that believe in him. So it's free grace that gives God all of the glory for salvation. And that's what, and we were, and that's what we're made for. We were made to glorify him. That's our, that is what we are supposed to do as his creation is we are supposed to give glory to God. And some people will glorify God in, in judgment, in punishment. One of these days when God punish, judges the world because of sin, he will receive glory in that day. Some will give glory to God, again, by being obedient as they can through faith. But at the end of the day, what is actually going to change in our life is all stuff he's going to do. When Jesus Christ returns, he's going to have to glorify us. He's going to have to change us. You know why? Because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. There's nothing good about this flesh. And we would all agree, I think, that even your most religious, moral person 
is dependent on the grace and mercy of God and must believe on him for salvation. And whenever we start putting all these different, you got to, you know, if you're not obedient, if you're not doing this, if you're not doing that, we're always lowering the standard for one. And you know what we're doing? We're comparing filthy rags. That's all there is to it. We are comparing filthy rags. And so free grace is the only soteriology where God gets all the glory. And so I do believe salvation is conditional. I, I absolutely believe that. Belief is the condition. Okay. I, I'm not a Calvinist. Okay. Belief is the condition. And uh, so, yes, I do not believe salvation is unconditional. It is conditional. Belief is the condition fully trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to believe and trust in him and your works and your performance and your surrender to discipleship, then I don't believe God accepts that at all. No, anytime we add our works to, any, to the scenario, we pollute the holy offering of God. I believe Jesus' body was the offering for sin. Everything that we read about in the Gospels that he did, that was the work of salvation. That is the offering that was presented to God. It is the offering that we must present to God in order to be accepted. And when we take that offering and we add our works in any way, shape, or form, even if we add our commitment to do whatever, we pollute the offering of God because God cannot lower his standard. That is why salvation has to be free. That is why salvation has to be without works, because in our sinful condition, we would contaminate the offering of God. And anytime we make proof of salvation about anything in our life, we are failing in glorifying Jesus Christ. We are failing to keep him the focus and to give him the glory. And so um, so I think where we're dis where we're dis one area where we're disagreeing is on what is justification or what is proof of our salvation. I believe it's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why I know I'm saved. That's because my salvation is based only on the work of Jesus Christ and his promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, whosoever believeth. And so that's why uh, I believe that's the justification. And so I need you to define turning. I need you to, to define repenting of sins. And can you do it without lowering God's standard and throwing out the law? Because it all matters. It all matters. And so when you talk about the rebel, okay, how are you not rebelling right now? Unless you are now miraculously without sin. I, I submit to you that we are all in rebellion if we actually are going to not throw out the law of God. And so what is the will of the Father? You said that too. You got to do the will of the Father. Well, can you define that too? Because you're going to Matthew 7. You're bringing up a passage where Jesus is going is talking about people who are becoming before him, declaring their many wonderful works. And what does he say? Depart from me, ye that do iniquity. You know why? Because that's in our flesh, that's all we can do. All we can do is iniquity. It's what we do by faith is the only thing that matters. So I need you to define from the scriptures, from the gospels, what do I have to do to do the will of the Father? Which works? I personally believe it's either all of the works or it is. Uh, another place we can find the answer is when they said, what works should we do to work the works of God? And he said, this is the work of God that you believe on him. So I believe when Jesus is talking about there, it's because again, if we're going to go and we're going to talk about our works, you better have kept 100% of that law. Or I think you'll be okay too. If you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, and you declare his righteousness. And so I think, I think, Going to Matthew 7 is one of the most self-defeating arguments that anyone could make to teach a lordship salvation. That doesn't work at all. So uh, what is the will of the Father that I must do to be saved, according to Matthew chapter 7? You know, and so we do. We hear a lot of words like faithful, obedient. You're, you're saying all these things, but it's this mysterious, unknown standard. What is the standard? What do you use to figure out 
if you're saved. Uh, what do you what standard do you use to figure out who else is truly saved? Since we're clearly talking, you know, you believe that salvation is about repentance, meaning repentance of sin. I do not deny repentance for salvation. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe we just get saved. The, the Holy Spirit just comes along one day and regenerates us. No, I believe we must repent. I what and what I believe that clearly means to repent. Uh, um, you you can't repent of something without repenting to something. I believe there's a million different things that we can repent of, but there is only one thing that we can repent to for salvation. And uh, and so when we see repentance in the Bible for salvation, um, it's you know there are many things that people are often called to repent of, but there's only one thing they're called to repent to. We never see the term repent of sins in the Bible because no one ever trusted into their sins to get them to heaven. We see them trusting in uh, uh, repenting of their idolatry because many people have followed other gods and have trusted in other gods and they needed to repent of those and repent to Christ. We see that them preach and repents to the Jews all the time. Why? They were trusting in their works of the law and they needed to trust in the works of Jesus Christ. They needed to repent of their dead works and have faith in Jesus Christ. But you, you can't find the phrase repent of sins in the Bible because no one has ever been dumb enough to trust in their sins to, to get them to heaven. But we do see repenting of other things. If you are a Buddhist, you need to repent of Buddha and repent to Jesus. If you're a Muslim, you need to repent of Allah and repent to Jesus. And let me, and you know what? Many people have repented of Allah. They've had repentance and repented to Buddha, still not saved. So there's only one thing. There's a million things you repent of, one thing you repent to. If you want to use any scripture about repentance, let's always talk about what they repented from and what they repented to. Let's make sure we emphasize those things. All right. Thanks very much for that 15-minute rebuttal. Now we are going to transition from the rebuttal section to my favorite section of most debates, which is the cross-examination <clears throat> section. And the first 10 minutes will be led by AK asking the questions. Then we'll, uh, then it'll be Tommy's turn for another 10 minutes and so forth, back and forth all together four rounds or I guess two rounds of well, 10 minutes each. So altogether 40 minutes of cross-examination. And I will get my timer ready, and I'll start the timer as soon as I hear AK start talking. Okay, uh, and I didn't mention this before, but it doesn't have to be strict question and answer. One person leads, but it can be a uh, dialogue nature of a cross-examination. All right, so, well, let's start in Matthew 7 then, Tommy. I mean, a good place to start. Matthew seven twenty one. Uh, according to Jesus, who enters the kingdom of heaven? According to Jesus, who enters the kingdom of heaven? Well, flesh and blood certainly does not enter the kingdom of heaven. No, according to Matthew 7, 21, who does? Oh, yeah, those who do the will of the Father. All right, so isn't that what I said? Isn't that a lordship salvation position? Right, no, but what is the will of the Father? Well, for example... Uh, the parallel account in Luke chapter 6, as soon as he says the parallel statement, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things which I say? He goes on to say, which is also found in Matthew, he that hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is, you know, like a house built upon the sand and the winds come and it crashes. So I would say it's in this context, everything that he's been talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. So would you say that the will of the Father in this context excludes all the things that he says in the Sermon on the Mount? No, I think it includes absolutely 100% everything. So I agree with you. So then, according to Jesus, if we could connect the dots here, those who do the will of the Father are those who do all of his will. Yeah, keep all the commandments. So, but isn't it the position of free grace that you can enter the kingdom of heaven while not doing his will? Yes, because there's two there's two ways. 
you can obey all the law or you can believe on Christ. See, what, what Jesus is clearly doing throughout the Gospels, remember, he's talking to a people who are trusting in their own righteousness. Paul said the problem with Israel, they went about to establish their own righteousness. Jesus is preaching all these things to reveal their sinful condition. And so uh, I don't throw out anything. I think you have to do 100% of every single thing that Jesus said to do to uh, make it into heaven unless we can just receive it as a free gift too. So I, I do two ways. You could you could technically say. The problem is 100% of us, 100% of people have failed when it comes to doing the will of the Father, following the law of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So, all, so all mess it up. Now, what I have said, Tommy, is that the context is not about the basis of salvation, that Jesus is simply describing the characteristics of those who do enter. And so, now, so what you just said was, well, he's describing those who trusted in their own righteousness. But Jesus, in this context, says statements such as, the one who enters is the one who does the will of the Father. He that does not do these things is like a house built upon the sand, and it crashes down. So, but where does he say, no, but you can't actually do any of this. It's just uh, justification by faith. Now, I want to clarify my question. I do believe justification by faith. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. So my question is, where do you justify the interpretation from the context that he's saying, all of what I'm telling you to do is actually hypothetical and can't be done? Uh, well, for one, in Matthew 5, same sermon, he said, For I say unto you in verse 20, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What we miss, and, and I, I, I want to see if I can give a brief explanation of this. What people miss about the Sermon on the Mount is we they don't understand the significance of what that was. If we if you remember, let me see how if I, I can give you the short version of this. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, okay, we see them cross through the Red Sea. According to First Corinthians, that was a, a, a baptism. But the Bible says with many of them, God was not well pleased, and they were. Uh, they died in the wilderness. We see that God came down on the mountain and he gave them that holy law on the mountain. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And so, uh, but they, but then after God came down on the mountain, they told him, they told Moses, he mentions this in Deuteronomy, don't let that happen again. That scared them. They, they did not want God speaking to them in that way again. And God told him, you've well spoken that which you've spoken. I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto me, unto him shall ye hear. Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. This was God coming on down on the Mount a second time, speaking to Israel, trying to show them, you know, what righteousness is and to, and to show them their sinfulness. They were wrong in thinking they could keep that law back when God gave it to Moses. And so here um, so Jesus, after he gets baptized and with, and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased after he goes into the wilderness and is tempted in all points, like the children of Israel were yet without sin. Then after that, he goes on the mountain like he did back in Exodus, but not in a glorified form that shook the mountain and melted the mountain. He speaks to him as a man and he reveals to them these holy laws. He gives them these some additional mm. things, and God had told Moses. I hate to interrupt, but I, I do want to press my question. Now, I had asked, how do you justify from the context of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is saying these things are hypothetical? And you said, well, in Matthew 5, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not get in. But that doesn't imply it's hypothetical. That's just a statement about what must be necessary to enter. That seems to go against what you're saying. Right, so... so you tell me how that's hypothetical. Well, it's not that it's hypothetical. This is legally. So Jesus is fulfilling a legal obligation under the law, under the prophecies of the Old Testament law. This was prophesied back in Moses' day that he was going to come, and whatsoever he tells you to do, they were supposed to 
do it. And so Jesus is showing them, hey, this is what it takes. They had done like the lordship crowd. They had lowered the standard. And he came and he is establishing these things. He is these he is clarifying certain things in the law because they had lowered the standard and he was letting them know you're not there. Under the law, you are you're not you're not even close. And none of them got close. So you, again, what, what Tommy is he's mentioned, it's not a hypothetical, it's a le it's it's a legal thing. Well, it's a legal doing. thing. I mean, so you say, but when Jesus says no man gets into the kingdom of heaven who does not do the will of the Father, mm -hmm. and he says, he talks about you must love, he says, love your enemies. That's we agree, that's not hypothetical. And that's loving is certainly not legal. I mean, is is loving your enemies a legal aspect? Is that's right there in the context? Now it is, yeah, because he, Jesus, uh, Moses said, "What whatever he says, you have to do." So yeah, it's no. A part when of Jesus the law says now. for you to love your enemy and be like your father, he's you're saying that he's saying this is legal, and you you're not really going to do it. I'm saying none of us have done all of it. We don't. But, but but what we Jesus says is time. you must love your neighbor as yourself. You must, I mean, when Jesus says, he that does not do these things I say is a house on the sand that crashes down. And what I want to know from the text is what you're, you're saying, he's just telling them something that really isn't, because I asked you if it's hypothetical. Let me, let me keep it simple. I mean, look at my time. Okay. I asked you if it was, Show me where it's hypothetical. And the text that you went to was, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, but then you said, well, it's not as hypothetical, but that it's legal. I'm saying, well, I'm, and, and it's, and it's 100% literal. Okay, so, so when Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're saying, actually, you will get into the kingdom of, in heaven if your righteousness doesn't surpass the scribes and the Pharisees, no, you'd have to you you have to do every bit of those things. Okay, well, so but it is your position that a person can be saved without repenting, without uh, surrendering the Lord. So, someone who hasn't done that, are you saying that their righteousness would surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? I'm saying nobody has accomplished what Jesus, what the law proclaimed one must do and so jesus went to the cross and so I, I can either shoot for exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees or i could believe on the lord jesus christ but again israel they do not recognize they they do not understand their sinfulness jesus preached these things to show them their sinfulness it, they were wrong when they uh, they made a mistake when they thought that they could keep that law that God gave. They should have called on the Lord for mercy during that time. And so that's and that's what we see the um, you know many of the outcasts doing. You know they came to Jesus, you know, with the attitude of have mercy. You have the publican, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's the one that gets justified, not the Pharisee. So, um, you know, again you know there's a you know what we're seeing in the sermon on the mount jesus he means everything he says and, and i am not saved by doing any of those things but i believe we as christians we should look at that sermon on the mount and we should do our best to follow it but at the end of the day you know we're dependent on god's mercy and grace and forgiveness because um none of us have done everything uh, mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, and we'd be crazy to think that we have. And and so, if you ask me, have I done the will of the Father? Uh, well, uh, at some law, point, we got to wrap up the because uh, my ten minutes is up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I was just trying to wait for a convenient break, but maybe it's better just to interrupt. Uh, that was the first ten minutes. So, the second ten minutes are going to start now uh, with Tommy in the driver's seat, leading the discussion. I will try to come back in again at the one minute point, and then I'll I'll just more openly interrupt uh, for this uh, when this ten minutes is up. So uh, you're you're in charge, Tommy. Okay. So 
how do you, AK, how do you know that you're saved? I mean, are you a hundred percent sure you're saved? If you are, how, how do you know that you're saved? Well, because the Bible says that we're saved through faith. I have faith in Christ. So I know I'm saved. That you, that's a short answer. I can give you a little longer answer. In John, uh, he lists several ways to know that we have eternal life. Loving the brethren, uh, loving God, abiding in him. It goes on and on. So those are the ways the Bible says a person can know they're saved. And I assume you're not talking about omniscience. Nobody's omniscient about anything, not even their own salvation, of course. Nobody has infallible knowledge. But when you ask me how I know, it would be the way the Bible says, because I believe in Jesus, trusting in him, and the ways that I mentioned in the book of John, the epistles of John. Okay. So what are what's some of your criteria that you use when judging someone else's salvation? If you are um, if you were witnessing to somebody and you're trying to find out if they're a believer or not, what what would you do to try to figure that out? Well, uh, so I'll answer this question, although recognizing that judging fruit and trying to prove salvation is never a debate that I, I try to have. It's always about how is salvation attained. But to answer your question, if I were going to evaluate a person, uh, I'll give you an example, a case study. I come across a lot of people a lot of times who talk about they do believe in Jesus, they are Christian, and who uh, are completely heathens and ungodly. A person that uh, recently said, well, I go to church on Sunday, and I know the person lives in fornication through the rest of the week, has a very filthy mouth, doesn't care about Christ, and the reason I know that is because uh, he takes pride in and takes joy in fornication and such like things of a, you know, a variety of things of different nature. Someone I know, so I, I do know him a little bit. So there's an easy case where you can look at someone and say they don't really believe. And I can make that judgment, number one, because Jesus told me to, you know, in Matthew 7, you judge men by the fruit. And I can know that because that's pretty easy. Now, I don't claim to be omniscient. So, there can there's there's plenty of uh, degrees of which you can't really know. I mean, you just you're not God. But there's always the easy ways, like the case that I mentioned. So I, I don't want to go on and on. But the way I would do it is by seeing if their claims to faith are do they take joy in their sin? That'd be a good indication. Do they love the brethren or do they hate them? And you got to know what love and hate is to know that. So that would be my answer. Okay. So. What are your thoughts when it comes to the spirit and the flesh? So I think you would agree, you know, in our flesh dwells no good thing. And your flesh is always going to enjoy sin. Now, the spirit is is grieved. Uh, you know, our spirit is grieved by sin if a, per is, if a person is saved. But don't you think, do you think it's possible for uh, somebody to just become very callous to those things? and? Um, isn't, you know, isn't using works, um, to determine someone's salvation. Wouldn't you consider that a works based justification? No, my judgment about somebody else is not the basis of their salvation. And that's all you can do. I mean, you asked me how I would do it and I don't walk around like a, you know, uh, a fruit detector all the time. Like that's my job. Although it is a certain, uh, it is naturally what we do from time to time, and even Jesus has to do it. But no, I mean, uh, uh, what was the first, you asked that question at the end. Uh, your first question was what? Um, you know, uh, I guess basically. Oh, about the spirit. Yeah, yeah, about the spirit and the flesh, yeah. Oh, yeah okay. I disagree. Uh, let me start here. Now, you, you mentioned isn't your flesh always enjoying sin? Well, you're conflating a physical pleasure with a person taking happiness and joy in the evil that they know they're committing. Your, your flesh, uh, I do not agree, as you said in your speech, that our flesh is always in rebellion. Your, your flesh is neutral. Your flesh is just material. 
the flesh is just uh, a physical part of who you are. You, the person, is what either rebels or serves. So I, th I think that's problems. I think that's a part of the problem behind some of your questions here. And well, that's part think, of my answer. I, th I think we're, we're disagreeing. You, the person, that's the soul is kind of the neutral one. The soul, if it gives, if it follows the spirit, it does right. If it follows the flesh, it sins. And so you, the person, so we're, we're not a dichotomy. We're a trichotomy. And so you, the individual, the soul, you choose to either follow the flesh or the spirit. Your flesh is always going to want to sin. Your spirit never wants to sin. Uh, yeah, I don't agree with that. I mean, when you, you say your flesh that. always wants to sin, you have to realize you're talking about a material thing. Your flesh is material. It doesn't have a mind. I mean, it has a mind. You are the mind, but you know what I mean. Your flesh doesn't have a desire. It just has pleasure. And, for example, it has the pleasure to uh, of, uh, of eating when you're hungry, it, the sensation of hunger and the sensation of pleasure when you eat. That's not sinful in of itself. God put that in you, Tommy. Now, that's part of the soul. Because there's our soul. Well, no, I mean, that's an appetite of the flesh. It's the flesh that gets hungry. I mean, I'm not denying necessarily that it might be a part of the soul, but it is a physical appetite of your body to eat. Right. And well, so your, your physical body, it needs sustenance, but our soul, that, that's why the manna wasn't enough for the children of Israel because their soul loathed that bread. It was sufficient to take care of their body and their physical needs but it did not satisfy their soul. And there is, there's food that is more pleasurable to our soul, you know, than it is, you know, there's things that are not necessarily good for our body, but yet brings certain pleasure and delight that feeds the soul, you could say. And well, I'm not that's in kind disagreement. Of another, that's kind of another subject, but I do think it's, it's, it's a problem when you don't recognize just how fully corrupt and sinful the flesh is well I'm, I'm not denying necessarily that it's sinful what i'm saying is your flesh itself your flesh itself because that's the how you spoke about it when you distinguish if you're in the context of your questions and even in your speech distinguishing between the person himself whether it be mind and soul or whatever and the flesh then i say the flesh itself is not sinful or righteous. It's just a thing that has certain pleasure senses. It's you, the person, that makes choices, not your flesh. And just like you mentioned with the children of Israel, when you said the food they got wasn't good enough for them, yeah, but that was in, it was they, the person, that wanted more than what they were getting. It wasn't the right. flesh saying, hey, this I want more than this. That's not what the, the flesh has impulses, and the person makes rational choices. It's not your flesh that sins. The Bible never teaches that. And so, but if I can go back to your question about the spirit, and at this point, I'm not really sure. I, I forget what really your question about the spirit was. Maybe you could rephrase your question about the spirit. Right. Well, I guess I'm just, I'm trying to, a, a lot of people, I'm, I, I, I believe a lot of even saved people find themselves very confused by this type of teaching because they're they don't recognize the fact that their flesh is not saved when it, when it, when you believed on Christ your soul you know you, you were your your soul was saved you know and it has eternal life but your spirit is what was regenerated and without sin but your flesh is still sinful and until we are glorified and we receive that new body we are always going to greatly struggle with these things and i and i i'm afraid that your what, what you're teaching people is is it leaves them confused and what they often end up doing is when they are giving their flesh what it wants they just start thinking well, I, I, I must not be saved uh no well, i've never said your that and i do want to respond to that i don't know how much time we have left about, you have about 30 seconds left, but you can go a little over if you need to. Well, if I may respond to that, Tommy, I think I think it's more confusing from your side. You start talking about the flesh uh, wants certain things. Well, but you don't mean just physical impulses because we could use the word want in that way, but you mean something different. You talk about the flesh as always in rebellion. 
uh, the you're, it's confusing when you start talking about the flesh as if it is a separate person from the person in the flesh, in which the Bible never says that kind of thing. I agree that the term flesh is used, like when he says uh, the flesh uh, profits nothing, or in my flesh, the flesh wars against the spirit, but that's talking about the, the impulses and the appetites that uh, the spirit wants to satisfy when it can't. That's what sin is. You know, you could... So, to be simple, I, th I think it's your position that is uh, confusing. The way you talk about flesh and, you know, the spirit's regenerated, but the flesh isn't. You really got to define all those terms. I agree that the flesh isn't saved in the sense of it needs to be redeemed through the resurrection. But that's not a spiritual salvation of the body. Well, I'll say it like this. It's not as if there's sin in our body. You said the flesh is sinful. I think that's confusing. I don't know what that means. Our flesh has certain impulses that have to be disciplined by the mind, but there isn't like an entity called sin, like dwelling in your DNA. I think all of that's confusing. And I, I suppose I should interrupt here uh, just to let you know we're halfway through the cross-examination, which means it's back to AK in the driver's seat. And again, I'll uh, leave the cross-examination, come back when there's just one minute remaining. And I'll, I'll try my best not to cut you off in the middle of a thought, but uh, I'll also try to keep the debate going on. So I'll start the 10-minute timer when I hear you start. Okay. Let me start with something I think we would probably agree on. You know, salvation, according to Romans 5, Tommy, is about having peace. Uh, and then Romans 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians talks about us being reconciled to the Father. So would you agree with me that an essential part of being saved, not, I'm not talking about what we do, but what, what happens is that our relationship with God is restored. We have a fellowship with him that we didn't have before being saved. Do you agree with that? I agree because uh, our spirit's been regenerated. It's been born of God. And so now we can have that connection with him. Okay. So I use the term fellowship. So we agree. You have this restoration. Our relationship is fixed. Now in first John, it says in verse, uh, Six of chapter one, it says, if we say that we have fellowship with God, we just talked about having fellowship and salvation, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So to say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, which is not surrendering to Christ, we're actually lying, which would mean we don't actually have fellowship. But is it your position that we can't actually walk in darkness and have fellowship with God? Define walk in darkness according to that passage. According to the passage, he says, it goes on to say, what, which passage uh, you have? First John chapter one. Okay. He goes on to say in verse seven, if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then I'll make my point here. If we say we have not sinned, now notice the emphasis is to say, if we confess our sins, if we say we have not sinned, that's bad. If we confess it, it's good. So the point is, to walk in light is to be truthful and honest. That's what he's talking about in context. To walk in darkness means is to hide your sins. It's to act as if you're not really in sin. And so to walk in the light would be you're honest. You confess your sin. You're open about it. You're not being dishonest and deceitful. So to walk in darkness uh, means, and this is my question, according to verse 6, that you don't actually, you're not telling the truth when you have fellowship with God. But your position says a person can't actually be walking in darkness and yet still have fellowship with God. How do you, how do you square that? Oh, I don't believe you can walk in darkness. Walking in darkness is somebody who's saying they don't have sin. God cleanses us and he forgives us. I'm confused. Now, when you say you don't believe we can, I don't know. What do you mean? You don't believe it's possible to walk in darkness? Yeah. Walk, walking in darkness, according to this, is somebody who is saying that they have no sin in them. If you, if you can't see that you're sinful, you're the one that's in darkness. 
So I, I agree. How can that, you confess sins if you don't see sins? And how can you see sins if you don't have sins? Okay, but we're in agreement with what it means to walk in darkness. But you said a person is you don't believe it's possible a person can walk in darkness. So are you saying that there's no such thing as a person who walks in darkness? No, there's tons of people walking in darkness because there's people who don't think they have sin. Okay, so so then if a since you do not believe in the free grace position that a person has to surrender to Jesus, then a person can be walking in darkness. So wait, surrendering to not being surrendered to Jesus is walking in darkness? According to first. So Adam, if a what? person refuses to acknowledge their sin, that wouldn't be surrendering to Jesus, would it not? Um in other words. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if if you if you don't think you have sins, you're blind. You are would that you are, be you're, you're in darkness. Okay, so, again, so I it agree. Sounds, it sounds to me like you're saying walking in darkness means you have sin. I said, well, what I said was to walk in darkness means to hide you. It does mean you have sin because the person, according to the text, let me, let me make sure that my position and my question to you here is clear. I, I believe, and I try to justify from the text, that what it means to walk in darkness is the person who's not being forthcoming with their sin. He's not confessing. it. So that implies he does have sin. It would, it would be meaningless to say he doesn't have sin, but he's hiding his sin. So, yes, to walk in darkness means you are in sin. Otherwise, it would be meaningless. But your position of free grace is that a person doesn't have to surrender to Jesus, which means they can be sinning and still be saved. Wouldn't that mean that a person can walk in darkness and still have fellowship with God, despite the fact that he says that would be a lie? No, you, because again, the whole point of that passage is you're recognizing your sin and we're receiving assurance that we are saved because he, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The free grace position for sure acknowledges that we are sinful. No, but no, no it, not but sinful. I mean, the free grace position, I mean, the whole point we're having in the debate is because you take the position that a person does not have to submit to Jesus, that they can be uh, they can be saved and not submitting themselves to him. That's the whole point of the debate. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have conceded in our conversation just now, in this few moments, this few minutes, that it is not surrendering to Jesus to walk in darkness if a person is hiding their sin. But that seems to be contradictory. Because I don't know how we can hide our sin when we're confessing our sins. Again, we can't. I'm not. I'm me, saying the person who isn't. Right. To me, the lordship position is the one walking in darkness because it sounds like they feel like they have repented of their sins. They are in obedience. They're not at recognizing just how sinful they are. To me, they're the ones that the to me the according to First John, the person walking in darkness is a person who would th think that they have repented of their sins. Well, to think you have repented means you have to have changed it and to confess it. I mean, to yeah. hide it and to say they've repented isn't... Well, to confess okay, it... Okay, but yeah. I, I want to keep on with my question, it. though. But to think Let, let me move on to a, a different text. You have to be dark and dark. <clears throat> well, I don't think you understand my question there, but that's okay. Let me move on in the second chapter of 1 John. So, you're a part of this debate by... The contrast here is I believe a person cannot be saved who has not surrendered to Jesus' authority. Mm -hmm. uh, you So you take the alternative point, that a person can be still in rebellion and be saved. <clears throat> okay, well, chapter 2 of 1 John says, uh, in verse uh, 4, The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. How do you square that with your position? Um, I don't, because you just said that my position, uh, let me make sure I get this right, says that we don't have to submit to the authority of God. I don't understand how my position teaches that. Because again, my position 
recognizes that one, that Jesus is Lord, that his law is an authority over us. And it, and it, uh, the confession of sins is an acknowledging of the guilt. And so if I were to go and stand trial and be accused of something that I did not feel like I was under the authority of, you know, then for example, you know, when they had the lockdowns going on and we were accused of violating, you know, some of the governor's orders. Well, I didn't recognize his authority because of the fact that I saw the constitution as a higher authority. And so the thing is, I don't understand how free grace is, is doing that. I think that's, okay, well, it looks like you're you asking that question. So let me, let me clarify. Cause I only got a minute position. Your position is to contrast. I mean, you're debating me. My position is you must surrender to his authority. Now you said our position is we have to recognize his authority, but you're talking about knowledge. I'm talking about surrender. Otherwise, why are you a part of the debate? If you believe, do you believe a person has to surrender to his lordship to be saved? Well, if you mean surrendering to his lordship in the sense of you have to now agree to keep the law of God. No, that you would, have to, you have to agree to serve Jesus because he's your authority. That's, that's the whole point. By what standard by the law of God or by grace? I didn't say it was by a standard. I said the attitude is that you have to surrender to his authority. I'm not talking about following standards. I'm talking about making Jesus your standard of, of authority. Jesus well, is the standard. I'll answer that right. way. Yeah, because and because of the fact that I recognize the only offering for sin that God will accept is the blood of Christ, I, I've surrendered to that, and I've put my faith totally in Him. I've made Him my high priest, and I have repented of my dead works, and I'm trusting in uh, in, in the work of Christ while in my uh, sinful condition. See, I, I think where we're we've got a disconnect going here, and I think this is what we need to talk about. It seems like. You know, you feel like your religious performance is somehow obedience to God. And and it's like, but are we talking about the, you know, the law or are we talking about grace? This is the perfect moment for you to ask that question if you'd like, because we're now going to shift into the final uh, episode or round or half round or whatever their term is, but the final 10 minutes of cross-examination with Tommy leading the way, I'll, I'll come back in at the one minute warning mark. Right. Yeah. And so I get, yeah. So I'm not, and I'm not trying to be obtuse or anything, but I'm, I'm trying, yeah. What I'm trying to do is I I'm, I'm trying to just hold to consistent biblical language and I'm trying to use the language the way the Bible does. And I think that's where the Lordship crowd, they often uh, kind of get off track a little bit. So let me, let me ask you this question because you've been talking about repenting of sins and what it sounds like to me that you are declaring that there be a certain uh, change in one's performance of the law that, uh, that they now have that they're saved that they didn't have before they were saved. You know, you brought up the person that's shacking up with somebody, which is obviously is a terrible sin. I agree uh, that, and, and uh, that, that is a very, that is a very serious thing. But so you would agree probably that repenting of sins mean you're going to turn from your fornication. You're going to turn from drunkenness. You're going to turn from stealing, murdering. But what about the least commandments? You know, do we have, so what, it, what is this standard? Because like, do I have to go to church? Do I have to get baptized? You know, I, I mean, the thought of foolishness is sin. Am I not allowed to have foolish thoughts anymore? Am I never allowed to think a, a lustful thing and look at a woman in lust? I mean, and, and the thing is too, how can I even agree to Oh, I've heard some people teach, well, you got to at least be willing to turn from all your sins. Well, the more I study the Bible, the more I find out just how sinful we are and how guilty I am. And so I feel like the Lordship 
salvation position, it puts such an emphasis on what you do after faith that it really confuses a person about whether they're, they're truly saved or not. And it always, you know, everybody's got a different standard for it. And so well, you're, you're, you're raising you're, several points, but I need to be able, you know, I'd like to respond to all of them, yeah. but give me one thing to respond to. Yeah. So, um, a, a person who doesn't repent of shacking up with somebody, would you think that person is truly saved? Uh, no, because, uh, then they're rebelling against King Jesus okay. and salvation is faith in the Lord. And I, this is what I explained in my, through the whole debate to trust in Jesus, to believe in him is to trust him for what he says. He says he saves those who submit to him. He, if he says, I am your Lord, that implies that Jesus expects submission. So to refuse to stop shacking up with somebody means that you're not trusting him because he never said you could do that and that it was okay and that you were that was permittable by his authority. His authority says the opposite. So you're not trusting in Jesus because he never said you could do those things. That's not faith. So no, you can't be saved without trusting in Jesus. See, it's a matter well, of what faith is. In Jesus. Can you trust in Jesus and shack up with somebody? No, because what is trust? Trust is to take somebody. The only way you can trust in a person uh, is to trust them for what they have said, what they are promising, you know, what they say. You can't trust in someone you know nothing about. I mean, they wouldn't have any meaning. So, so, therefore, to trust in Jesus means to trust him for what he says, including who he says he is and what he says about himself or about what you are supposed to do. So if Jesus has not said, and he said the opposite, if Jesus has not said that he is okay with, and you are permitted by his lordship to continue to, I think shacking up was still your question, then to continue to do so means that you don't trust him because he said not to do it. Okay. So I, now I had people that um, several years ago that were coming to our church and they were shacking up. And they were shocked when I told them that wasn't okay because that's how uh, just backwards our country has gotten. So what if a person hears the gospel, believes it, calls on the Lord for salvation, and but yet they still haven't, but they don't know they're not supposed to shack up. Are they saved while they're still in that sinful state? Well, if I grant to you, and for the sake of discussion, I will, but so if for the sake of discussion, I grant to you that a person truly doesn't know that's sinful. Uh, justification is through faith, and I've said that biblically, faith is to trust Jesus. And I said in my opening, Tommy, that repentance, which comes from trusting Jesus, is not a matter of listing all your sins and saying, I'm going to turn from this, I'm going to turn from this, because I said, in fact, you're asking me about something I talked about, a person may not know all of what is a sin. Mm -hmm. It's not, okay, here's my quick answer, or my simple answer to you. Justification, and I never said, that justification is through the precision of your performance. It's through faith, and a faith that works through love. What a person has to do is submit to Jesus. If they don't know that Jesus is against something, they're not going to turn from it. But the fact that they have surrendered means that if they did know, they would, because they serve Jesus. My position as lordship is that a person who is not interested or who does not seek to serve Jesus is not saved. A person who is seeking to serve him may not know all of what they're supposed to know. When they do know it, they will change because they seek to please Jesus. That's my answer, that if a person doesn't know that's it's not the precision or the fullness of your knowledge that justifies you it's your faith that works through love not the accuracy of your performance and not the precision of your knowledge does that answer your question yeah i think so so if so you would believe though that if they were truly saved when they learned that god was against it they would quit shacking up absolutely because that's the kind of people who surrender to jesus the people who don't may not stop. As Charles Bing, and I'm not saying you're uh, 
share the same view as him, but he's also free grace. And I'm just giving you an example of what you're asking me about. Being said, who's a free gracer, uh, people ask me if they have to stop sleeping around. And I say, well, God wants you to, but no, you don't have to. That's exactly what I'm opposing. And that is confusing, Tommy. That is terrible. And that is not biblical. Now, you may not say that he represents you, but that is, you are taking a similar position, the very fact that you're here in the debate opposing what I'm saying. So what about the person who smokes? What if it, what if, cause here's the thing too. Sometimes it takes people a long time to get victory over the flesh. So at what point did they get saved? So let's say, you know, I learned I'm not supposed to be smoking or drinking, but now we got a lot of Christians that say it's okay to drink too, as long as you don't get drunk. All right. But it, at what point Okay, if I if I hear the gospel and I hear all these sins I'm supposed to forsake, and I would assume you would agree, it has to be all of them. You can't just you can't just pick and choose. You at least got to be willing to pick all of them. What kind of time frame do I have to get my act together? Because isn't it something we're supposed to like grow in grace and knowledge? So it's like, you know, some people have a reformation real quick. Some people it takes years. So the you know the guy who took it was five years before he gave up certain things. Did he get saved at the same time? You know they both made professions. One guy immediately got his act together. Another guy it took him five years because he was just so deep in sin. At what point did that second guy get it? You know was it after he finally got the victory? Your the problem is. Tommy, that you're still thinking that I'm saying justification is based upon, upon performance. It's based upon faith, a faith that works through love. It's not the precision of your performance. It's not the perfection of your performance. It's not the, uh, uh, which, which is implied in, well, how long? I mean, how well do you got to do before you're saved? You're still thinking, I'm putting justification in performance. I'm putting it upon faith. But faith biblically is one that trust in Christ, which implies a person seeking to serve Jesus. So I'll give you my quick answer. You ask me, which point is a person saved? When they have genuinely put their faith in Christ, the kind of faith that the Bible talks about, that trust in him as Lord. When they've genuinely done that, they've been saved. Mm -hmm. Will that change their conduct? Yes, progressively over time. Salvation is not based upon the performance. It's based upon the faith. But the form performance, if it's true faith, is going to change. So I hope that I made that clear. So what about guys like David who years into his relationship with the Lord committed some pretty horrible sins? So just that we're sort of out of time, but I think it makes sense to have you answer the question and then uh, go to the conclusion. So if you could, I don't know if that's a quick answer. Well, yeah, it's it's when you say what about David? Well, what you're asking would require omniscience about a person. Uh, I have never claimed to know. I think salvation is a relationship. It's based upon faith, you know, uh, and what faith truly is. And the relationship between a person and God and their degree of faith varies from one person to another. It's just like different marriages. When a person would decide this marriage is isn't any longer here. I mean, I can't be with this person. You know, it's not like there's not like a litmus test that is the same for everybody. So my point is, I, I can't be omniscient about every person, what they're truly like, exactly what their attitude is, how much faith do they have. I can't make those kind of precision judgments. Only God can do that. I'm giving you uh, what the Bible says that can generally be applied, uh, such as a person is saved when they've truly put their faith in Christ. And that a person who's refusing to shack up with somebody or stop shacking up with somebody isn't saved. Now, that's an easy answer. But when you're asking, what about David? You know, he's saying, well, I mean, I, that's a very difficult question, admittedly, because I, I'm not omniscient about David, his heart, and different times you're asking about a David. I mean, that's a very difficult question. I'm not omniscient. I guess I'll, I'll call that the, the end of the cross-examination section. Which brings us to the conclusions, and I assume we're going to continue in the same uh, speaking order. So that would mean 
that AK, this is your opportunity for a five minute closing. And I will start the timer when you start speaking. Okay. Uh, well, just right off the bat, since we're at the end of the debate, uh, except for the audience q and I want to say thanks to Tommy once again for the debate. I want to thank, once again, Turton Fan for on such short notice coming in and moderating. He's done just fine here. Now, all right, so let me conclude all this. Um, one of the main problems, and it, this seems to be and is in all my experience with Free Grace Guys and many others, is that it seems no matter what I say, Tommy still is under the impression that I'm putting justification on performance. I'm putting justification on faith. The disagreement of the debate is uh, about what is true faith. So for, and this is why I asked at some point in the debate, why is Tommy in the debate? I mean, the very fact that he's here debating me on this issue means he does believe People can be saved who haven't surrendered to Jesus. That means there can be active rebels who are saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. True faith uh, means a person is not an active rebel. Everybody stumbles. The Bible does teach that. Every Christian. That's what James says. But it doesn't deny that they have faith. But an active rebel doesn't. Because I think what the problem is is that Tommy doesn't fully understand what biblical faith is. To trust in Jesus, the only way you trust in a person is to trust what they have presented to you about themselves. So when Jesus uh, says that he's your Lord, well, that means he's saying you have an obligation to obey him. So if you trust in him, you will seek to obey. That's what a person does who trusts that the person is telling you the truth, that they're your Lord. If you do not surrender, then you're not trusting in what they said. How could you? If you're doing the opposite and still believing that they're going to do for you their promises, when they said the promises on those who have submitted. If Jesus says, I'm your Lord, that means we have the obligation to submit. But then you choose not to submit, then you don't trust him. Jesus never promised, not one single passage has Jesus ever promised to save those who are actively rebels. And I choose my words carefully. Every Christian sins, but that doesn't make us rebels. I'm talking about someone who hasn't surrendered, who doesn't seek to serve Jesus. That's not faith. You're not trusting in Jesus if you do that. That's what faith has always been about. I gave you the example of Adam and Eve. That's what God has always wanted was that kind of faith. I'm not talking about a justification based upon a reformist, justification based upon faith, this kind of faith that God has been seeking from the very beginning, the kind of faith that G that Eve lost, where she didn't trust G uh, God, so she did something that was harmful to her and the rest of humanity. To say that God will save a person who isn't trusting in him, like that kind of faith, which is the only saving faith there is, means that a person doesn't really know what God wants. And uh, the and in the uh, Matthew chapter 7, let me say, Tommy came with the general idea that a lot of people have who kind of share his view is, uh, well, this is a hypothetical. He's saying, here's what you would have to do if you wanted to be saved, if you're going to go by performance. No, Jesus is not talking about what you would have to do. He's saying, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to do the will of my Father. But because every passage... It talks about doing the will or obedience to someone like Tommy, no derogatory intention there, but someone like his theology, when they see obedience or something, they start thinking of justification by works. Well, this must be legalism, and he's saying, well, legally speaking, you have to do that. You have to recognize that Jesus is not talking about the source of your salvation there. Wow. He's not talking about how you get saved. He's not contrasting it with faith. He's talking about here's the kind of person that enters the kingdom of heaven. And I asked him, uh, would not the will of the Father include all the Sermon on the Mount? He said, yes, all of it. Okay, so you can't, if a person has refused to bow the knee to Jesus, that means they're not doing, they're not even seeking to do the things in the Sermon on the Mount at all. It's not their interest. But Tommy says that includes, that is included in the will of the Father. So, then it isn't true that a person who doesn't do the will of the Father 
will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's just blatantly a contradiction. Now, he's not trying to contradict. I know he's trying to harmonize it, but I think as we all saw there, there's a struggle there because he still sees every passage about obedience as about the source of justification, but it isn't. That's my time. Indeed it is, and now we are switching the driver's seat back over to Tommy to wrap up the debate with the, of course, there's still the audience Q&A coming after, but the, the formal part of the debate, we're wrapping up with a five-minute closing. I will start my timer uh, when you start speaking. Yes. So I, I need to address again this huge misrepresentation that free grace people have not surrendered. No, we do not make void the law by faith. Yeah, we establish the law. We recognize our guilt. We recognize our incapability of keeping the law, doing the law, our incapability of, you know, our righteousness, that is filthy rags being acceptable to a holy God, and we believe the message that he paid for our sins and that he gives us eternal life and that it is, it is completely free. And when we do, when we call on him for that, like he said to do, when we accept the free gift, that is obedience. And that is, that is the will of God, just as obeying all of the law is God's will. God is not okay with us violating any law what's whatsoever but at the same time he recognizes that we are not capable of following all of the law and so jesus christ died paid for our sins and has offered it freely now he gets 100 of of the glory of god and you know you mentioned the kingdom about entering the kingdom you know there's john the baptist preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand yet the kingdom didn't come. Remember when after the story of Zacchaeus, when everybody's getting excited in Jerusalem because they thought the kingdom was going to immediately appear? Well, it didn't appear. You know why? Because Israel was not ready. They had not been cleansed by the things of the law. They had not kept the law of God. They were not acceptable as a people. And so Jesus Christ went to the cross, brought in the new and better covenant. And now uh, we've been out uh, doing all the things that Israel failed to do for those 2,000 years. And, and we are bringing people to Christ. And one day when Christ returns and he comes again, there will be an acceptable people, not people who achieved you know, a, some level of righteousness by the works of the law, but people who have received cleansing through the work of Jesus Christ. And free grace is the, is the only soteriology that recognizes all of the law of God is authoritative. It is the only soteriology that has us walking in the light, that recognizes that we are sinful. Walking in darkness is not somebody who's not a very good Christian and doesn't it doesn't behave very well. Uh, that is a person who does not recognize their sinfulness. And there are many religious people, moral people, doing their best to keep the law like a lot of the Pharisees, but they all come short of the glory of God and they are not going to go to heaven because they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They have not believed on Christ for salvation. And, and so these are the things that we've got to make sure we emphasize. And I, I'm afraid the Lordship position, it puts way too much emphasis on the individual, their behavior. It makes the justification all about uh, the individual, and what do I see in that person? I cannot pretend to judge for everyone. I obviously, I expect a change in people's life when they get saved. I mean, the Holy Spirit moves inside. Their spirit is regenerated, but I don't know how long that change is going to take. I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. There are Christians who I believe get saved, but they never bring forth any fruit that they do not. They're, they're just not fruitful Christians. And that's a shame. They're not going to have rewards someday, but they'll still, they're still saved. One Jesus minute. didn't come to see what he can get from us. He came to save us and to, and to help us. 
And when we make salvation about our works at all, or even proof of salvation about our works, then we take away from the glory that belongs to Jesus Christ. And are there a lot of free grace people that bring shame to the true gospel? Absolutely. And, and we all do. But at the end of the day, our, our, main, uh, our, our main emphasis should be declaring his righteousness. And you know what? Shame on you if you're declaring his righteousness while you're living like a devil. You know, that's confusing. You know, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us the denying ungodness and world lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But the Bible also shows us, too, that now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. A change is coming at the return of Christ because we're all going to need it because our reformation is not, still not sufficient to a holy God. Just like he regenerated our spirit, he's going to regenerate our bodies one of these days too. And he's going to do it because we put our faith in him. Thanks very much for that concluding statement. That's the end of the formal part of the debate, but we still have the exciting and always popular audience question section. And I believe the plan was to have this be a timed overall timed section, but to let loosely go back and forth with, if the question is directed to one of you, then uh, the, that person answers first, and then the other person has the opportunity to re respond. And then the person to whom the question was asked could provide some clarification. <clears throat> and uh, I'll try to pick some questions according to the best of my ability. Uh, so I have thankfully dozens of questions to choose from. And yeah, and I'll just I'll say by the way that at the beginning we committed to thirty minutes at the least. Take it from there. I think Tommy wasn't wanting to go uh, too long after, so we'll kind of play it as we see it there. All right. So uh, let's start with a question for Tommy. Trinity asks. In Romans 2, 6 through 10, we read that those who obey unrighteousness and do not persevere won't be saved. Mm -hmm. So how could someone who believed in Christ obey unrighteousness and be saved? Yes, great question. So, and, um, and AK, he brought up the hypotheticals before. Well, let, let's read this. Uh, passage who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath tribulation anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the jew first and also the gentile but glory honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the jew first and also the gentile for there is no respect of persons with god for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So he's comparing Jew and Gentile, showing he's going to judge them both the same is, is what he's doing. And so basically what he says here, if they do good, if they obey, they get eternal life. And I wish I had time to, you know, I'm not going to take time to expound all of chapter two, but it goes into chapter three. And it's like, well, what advantage hath the Jew? Well, in every way, chief, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. A Jew is going to be much more likely to obey all of the law of God because they have the law of God. But understand the chapter divisions were added later to help us find things. He's still continuing the thought. And you know what he says in verse 9? What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise. For we have both proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. Basically, in chapter two, it's saying, yeah, if you obey all the law, you'll get eternal life. But guess what? None has done it. None of the Jews did. None of the Gentiles did. And if I could take the time to expound all of chapter two and three, that is exactly what you will see. Chapter two is showing if you obey the law, you'll have eternal life. But chapter three shows us nobody's done it. Uh, 
Okay, well, so for my part, <clears throat> it once again, it comes down to merely hypothetical because the man in the verse, he says, who uh, by perseverance, verse 7, in doing good, seek for glory and honor, honor and immortality, they get eternal life. Once again, he said, well, none has done it. So once again, it's still merely a hypothetical. I would agree with Tommy that in the passage, Paul is demonstrating that the Jews will not be judged differently than the Gentiles just because they're Jews. But this is not merely hypothetical, because in Paul's understanding, those who have faith are those who will seek for good. There are people who get immortality because Paul doesn't separate someone believing from someone who's obeying. I said before that Tommy, and I've heard it from many of his theology, that every time they see obedience or uh, works mentioned that any passage it's always well this has to be hypothetical because they always think the person's always going to be speaking about the same topics which is the source of justification but paul is simply saying if you can those who who uh do one thing are going to be judged and condemned and he says those who seek for glory and honor immortality will get eternal life he's not saying oh they merit their salvation this is a characteristic of those who believe that's the point which would be meaningless because, once again, well, nobody ever does that. Because Tommy thinks is still t speaking about how a person is saved. It is not. Paul even mentions in verse 4, <clears throat> uh, Do you not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? So he acknowledges that repentance is a part of seeking for good. This isn't merit. This is still a category of people that uh, are those who believe as well. It's those who seek for good. <clears throat> That's my answer. Can, can I respond to that? Yep, you get the last word. Since okay, I'm so I'm, listen, if we need to park on this passage, I'd love to do that. But, okay, and first off, do not associate um, my expounding of the scripture with your average free gracer your free gracers on the internet are some of the worst expositors of scripture that you will ever hear i am regularly embarrassed by the free grace community and how they represent the scripture okay now if you want to show where i represent a scripture wrong go right ahead do you believe that what paul is talking about here that there are any that has have done what he said one must do for eternal life there because, listen, I can show you, he is showing that, yeah, if you do this, you have eternal life. But that's what chapter three is. It's a continued thought. Nobody's done it. No, not one. <clears throat> Has it, do, you, do you believe anyone's accomplished that? So in the in this format, normally that you would that would be your the last word on this particular okay. question before we moved on. I don't know if you guys want to depart from that by mutual consent. I I don't have. I'd rather, I'd rather stick to the format. That's okay. fine. We yeah we can we can stick to the format. But I I I, I dare anybody out there listening to show me where anybody has done that. I can show you in chapter three. No, not one. All right. Uh, the next question is for. Uh, AK, uh, the question is this, doesn't lordship skip the whole chastisement process? You go straight from being saved and a child of God to being eternally condemned. Doesn't make sense to me. Sounds like <laughs> there's not really a question mark at the end of the last part, but the, uh, the question is, does it skip the whole chastisement process? No, I don't. I don't believe it skips it at all. I, I said, I, I've been saying this the whole debate, that it's not about being sinless. And I said, such as what James says, that we all stumble in many things. We just weren't talking about necessarily focusing on chastisement. I was talking about, I, I try to make it clear that I'm not talking about a Christian who's stumbling. I, I acknowledge that that happens and that that's not what I'm talking about. The debate is not about Christians who stumble and are imperfect. Otherwise, there would be no perfect or point in a debate. I said that we're talking about an active rebel, and I choose that terminology to show what I'm talking about. I'm someone who has not bowed the knee. Chastisement is for his people. It's not for someone who hasn't bowed the knee. I've been making the point in the whole debate that if you haven't bowed the knee, you're not his people. He's not chastising people that are not his people. That's not what he does. He chastises his sons and daughters. 
I've tried to prove in the debate that if you have not bowed the knee to Jesus, you're not one of his in the first place. That's what the debate has been about. Uh, so I do believe there's chastisement because I believe Christians need it. But the debate has been about not about stumbling Christians, but about active rebels, people that have not surrendered at all, and that they are not, in fact, Christians in the first place. So would you, if you'd like to respond, here's your opportunity. Yeah. Well, uh, again, God's not going to chastise you unless you're sinning, unless you're rebelling, unless you're actively rebelling. And that's exactly what he does to his children, because we definitely do all those things. And again, if you don't get any chastisement, then that is that's a good indicator that you are not you are not one of his. Uh, but at, at the same time, um, yeah, this this proves my point. And it also proves he's Lord. It proves he is in authority. And when I receive that chastising of God, you know, I recognize this because of my sin. And I recognize that that he can do that because I am his child. So, again, I, I think. I just I find it so offensive to act like free grace does not, you know, teach submission to the lordship of Christ. I, I believe lordship salvation. Um, it does. It makes the focus of salvation, the proof of salvation on one's performance. And and I think it greatly straw man's uh, the free grace position. But because he's Lord, he can definitely punish me. And he does. And he proves it. Okay, so for my last work, it, again, it's the same problem. Tommy said in the beginning of his answer there, his, his reply, he said, uh, if you're sinning, you know, those Christians that are chastised, if you're chastised, you are sinning, you are actively rebelling. So once again, he's failed to get the distinction I've been trying to emphasize over and over. When I say active rebel, I have clarified that I'm not talking about a Christian who's imperfect. I'm talking about someone who's not submitting at all someone who does not bow the knee uh the assumption from tommy is that you can be a christian and not surrender the knee but that's the debate so to say well if christians are chastised they must be sinning that's active rebellion but i've clarified i'm not meaning that when i'm talking about an active rebel i'm telling you what i mean by my terms i'm talking about someone who isn't surrendering at all not a christian who surrenders but is imperfect yes christians do sin but it's not the same as what I'm talking about as someone who has not saw the need or the interest and does not seek to serve Jesus at all. The person who takes joy in their sin, who's not seeking to change at all, who doesn't see the need to or does not want to. You ha It's a constant problem with my free grace friends that Tommy does, in fact, share with others that I talk with. They don't get the distinction. I make it over and over again. They can't see the difference between a stumbling Christian who's imperfect and just someone who isn't surrendering at all. They, they can't get the difference. And that's why we have these debates. I'm trying to be educational. But you have to understand that if you're going to understand this at all. Tommy, now you're in the hot seat with this question from Swenson Bailey. He asks, Simon Magus was said to have believed in the gospel and been baptized. Yet, when he asked to buy the power to give the spirit, he was rebuked and told to repent. Is this free grace? Um, I mean, being told to repent of something as a believer, I don't know how that's not free grace. Free, I, 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 I don't know if we're conflating free grace with you know hyper grace and antinomianism. Um, and in the definition I read in the beginning, where it talked about free grace, um, it did acknowledge in there that. Um, uh, you know that uh, it, it, it or it distinguished between uh, the free grace and hyper grace to where like the law just doesn't matter anymore. We obviously are under God's authority. the The law is an authority over us. <clears throat> we just don't pretend that we actually obey all those things, you know, and uh, we don't use it as any kind of proof of our salvation. And so. Uh, being rebuked, being told to repent as a believer, you better believe it's something that we're going to hear all the time. Okay, so my response to that is what Tommy has said there, a part of it, and what he said uh, a number of other times, is that he thinks, I'm saying free gracers don't believe. Uh, well, in, in his closing, he said that I say that free grace have not surrendered. 
that they don't believe you should or that all free gracers live in rebellion or something like that. The debate is not about whether there are free grace people who believe you should repent or who do repent. Uh, it's obvious that Tommy believes you should. It's not about what you should do in general. It's about whether you have to to be saved. That's the debate. I'm not saying what free gracers necessarily do, whether they do repent, whether there are some who do. I'm saying they, the teaching of the theology is that you don't have to to be saved. Otherwise, why would Tommy be here debating me? The fact that he's here contrasting his view with mine shows that he does believe you do not have to. It has nothing to do with whether they do, because different free grace people will do different things. It's about whether you have to to be saved. Now, concerning Simon, I'll say the point of it is that what Peter says is that he has to repent so and pray that he could be forgiven. But you can't be saved without being forgiven. The fact that he needs to be forgiven shows that he is not saved, at least in that moment. Now, of course, they would say he well, never was. That's a different discussion. I think it's obvious that he was because just as it says in verse 12 that they, the others, believe Philip and baptized, and Simon himself believed and was baptized, it's saying he did what they did. So unless they weren't really saved, uh, he was actually saved just like they were. And the fact that he needed forgiveness in this obvious wicked rebellion then he needed to uh, he needed to repent to be saved. And you get the last word since this was a question to you. All right. Well, notice what he said in Acts eight twenty two. He says, "Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee." Sometimes there's sins that if we do them, there is no place of repentance. Repentance is not always about salvation, too. For example, uh, you know when and. Um, when the Bible says, oh, man, I, ha I had it and it went away. But re God giving repentance, that's allowing you a way out of judgment for your sin. For example, like if I go and I murder somebody, I don't think the judge is going to give me repentance. And because I feel bad about it, I'm not going to be punished for that thing. And so sometimes there's uh, we need to repent of false doctrine. Why? So we can recover ourselves out of the snare uh, of the devil. And so repentance, it's not always about salvation. And what Simon was trying to do was very wicked. And so Peter's telling him, hey, you need to repent and pray God that God doesn't hold you accountable for this. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened after that. But, you know, he he definitely had a repentant <laughs> attitude. And he's telling Simon, hey, or he's telling Peter, hey, you pray that, you know, God doesn't bring this judgment on me and the bible doesn't tell us what happened in that story but um you know be but yeah being so repentance it's not always about salvation sometimes we need repentance so god does not punish us god doesn't chasten us and um sometimes you know might, might you you can cross a line and either way you're getting judged all right here's one for ak I think it's directed for AK. It says, did Christ die for all sins? It's from Truth Seeker. Did Christ die for all sins except continual habitual sin? And isn't committing a sin or a few a day, I guess a sin or a few a day, considered practicing sin, especially if they're the same ones? Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus died to redeem a people for himself. While people for himself would not include people that are not surrendering to him at all, right? That's the whole point. Now, when I said earlier in the debate, I made this like an important point. Salvation is for God. It absolutely is. That's what it says in the Bible. It says uh, that all things are through him and for him, speaking about both Christ and the Father in different contexts, but it's for him. The church is his. He's the head of the church. It belongs to him. He purchased it. He bought it. That means it's for him. Even though Tommy seemed to deny that, it actually says it is. He, when you purchase something, you're buying it for your use. Salvation is for God, <clears throat> excuse me, to serve him in his kingdom. And so he died to redeem a people. He didn't die so that people can continue in their sins. He died to save them from their sins. That's what it says in Matthew. Save them from their sins isn't just saving them from the penalty. That, that, that would be good for us, but he isn't just wanting to save us from the penalty. He's wanting to save us from the life of the sin, from the conduct of the sin. So he died to redeem a people. 
which excludes the idea of someone who isn't surrendering at all and still being his people. And then the second part of the question, isn't committing a sin or a few a day considered practicing sin? No, because then the Bible could never call somebody faithful. You have to recognize, it goes back to the same thing, and I, when I did it, debated with the free grace guy, uh, Chris Morrison, it was the same problem. You cannot recognize the biblical distinctions between a, a stumbling Christian who's imperfect, who does sin, but is a work in progress. You can't distinguish between that and someone who isn't a work in any progress, someone who isn't surrendered at all. They, they cannot figure out that distinction. The Bible calls people faithful. And it also says there are people who are not faithful, but they can't figure out the distinction. They think, well, everybody's got to be unfaithful because everybody sins. I'm not talking about just everybody sinning. That's not what practicing sin in the Bible is. Uh, when you say habitual sin, it, it's the difference between somebody who's sinning because they're not serving Jesus, and so therefore sinning is what they do. It's the normal part of who they are. They serve sin. The person who serves Jesus is, isn't always perfect. They're not always perfect at serving Jesus, but it is what they're aiming to do. A person can walk in one direction. This is a long answer. I'm about to be done. But stumble as they go, but they're still aiming the same direction. A rebel sinner who's not surrendered isn't walking in the direction of Jesus. So it's about two different directions that you walk, and nobody's walk is perfect, but it is about the direction in which you're going. Anyway, that's my answer. Yeah, well, I think that me and AK, we have two very different definitions of surrender because he keeps saying that free grace doesn't teach you, you know, that you don't have to surrender. No, free grace, we surrender. We are guilty. We are, we are hopeless. We are incapable. We are under the authority of God. We are on our way to hell because we are so sinful and God's law is holy, every bit of it, all of it. And, you know, he's, you know, th there is no difference between habitual sin and just a little bit here and there and a Christian stumbling. No, sin is sin. And we sin because we are sinful, whether we do it a lot, whether we do it a little bit. And again, what he's creating is he's lowering the standard of what sin is. He's lowering the standard of what righteousness is. I'm saying Every bit of the word of God is good. We're, we're, we are fully guilty of it, and we are under the authority of it, and there is no difference when it comes to these things. And that's why free grace is the only way, too, where we, one, where we only have hope, but it's the only way, too, we can have actually have a relationship with God because God is holy, and if I got to worry about sinning and messing up and losing my salvation or proving that I'm truly saved or whatever— I can't do anything just out of faith. I can't do anything out of love. I'm going to be obeying because I'm, I love myself. But when you understand it is a free gift, it's forever. And it has nothing to do with works. You know, anytime I do anything for God by faith, I'm doing it out of love. You can only do that under free grace. Okay. Well, my final response to that then is a couple things. He, he keeps mentioning something about proving your salvation. He said that throughout the debate here. Uh, it's, the debate has never been about proving salvation. I'm not interested in proving. It's a different topic. It's about how you get saved. He said that, once again, he said the same thing, that I believe free grace do not surrender. I never said that they don't surrender. Some will, some don't. The debate is whether you have to to be saved. Now, he didn't mention that, too, and he was in, very inaccurate. He said... AK believes that free grace teaches you don't have to be saved. Those are his words. That's exactly what they teach. Otherwise, why is he at the debate? What is he contrasting? Because I, lordship salvation is the position that you have to surrender to be saved. If he agrees with that, why is he in the debate? He obviously doesn't. Free grace doesn't. That's what it's known for. That's what it does. not So, no, free grace teaches you don't have to. They believe you should. It's good if you do. Uh, many of them do, I'm sure, but the point is, they say the theology says you don't have to. That's what the debate it is. That's exactly what the theology is. Otherwise, why would he be here? Here's a question for both, and uh, I think that the tradition in other channels is to have, for questions for both, for each just to give one answer without follow-up. So uh, I would suggest we do that here. 
the question is, can both men break down Luke 24, 44 to 49, which is a, uh, which is a section, well, the, um, I'll leave it to you how to break it down, and then connect that with Acts 2, 36 through 39. I see that they must do something, not grace alone. And the person saying that they see, uh, Richard Briggs is saying that he sees Acts 2.38 fits with Luke 24.47. Uh, so not grace alone is uh, Richard Briggs' contention here. I'll leave it up to you which which person answers first, and the, unless you need me, you guys, unless you guys need me to pick, then I'll, I I'll be happy to pick. You got a preference, Tommy? Yeah, I, I can go. So yeah, let's. I'll read the past real quick. So, and he said unto them, "These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me." Then opening their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witnesses of these things. Uh, so I don't understand where repentance is not faith alone, because we preach repentance. You again, you have to believe on Christ, you have to receive remission of sins. Uh, through Christ, so um, I don't I don't understand how that's not faith alone. Again, I think a lot of people maybe you're thinking that because when they see the word repentance, they're always think adding that those words of your sins on there. But um, no, it's we're preaching re repentance and remission of sins, which is something that's completely through Christ. And then what was the other passage in Acts 2, what? 36 to 39, and specifically okay. 38. Yeah, where he said, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Um, yeah, so I don't understand how that's adding to faith either. I don't know if it's because it says, and be baptized on there. Uh, but, um, you know, that's not saying that the baptism saves them. That is, But that is what you should do. That's something that we see. Um, you know, in the scriptures that they are supposed to repent and, you know, we are supposed to do good works. The good works do not save us, but we are supposed to do those things. We are, everybody who gets saved should get baptized. And, uh, but, uh, and then too, you know, and, and there's another element to this too. I'd rather not spend a whole lot of time on this. I, I definitely uh, don't want to take the time to argue about it, but we do need to remember in Acts 2, Peter is preaching not just to individuals like we do today. He's preaching to a nation. They're trying to save their nation who is under the judgment of God for the killing of Jesus Christ. They are going to be destroyed as a nation as a result of this, and they did need to repent of that, and they needed to follow Christ. And thankfully, many individuals did do that, and they went to heaven, but the nation never repented and followed Christ, and they were destroyed in 70 AD. So, um, un, you know, so that's, there, there's a lot we could say about that, but there's, that's, that's faith alone for salvation. Yeah. Well, so first of all, the question asked about grace only, uh, I don't see any, there isn't anything in either one of these texts that would say none of this is great. Salvation is always by grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Salvation can never be merited. You can never be worthy of it. You never deserve it. It's never given to you because of how good you are or as an exchange for the good things that you do. So it's always by grace. I think the person may conflate grace with, he may think grace means unconditional. Well, that's not, those are two different ideas. Salvation is by grace, always, but it's not unconditional. You do have to believe. As far as connecting the two, well, now I will say this and how it relates to our debate in verse 47, when Jesus said that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Well, if it's repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the context means it's repentance from sins. That's the, that's the point of the context. It's not repentance from something that has nothing to do with sins for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, John the Baptist was getting people to repent of their sins. 
the repentance of sins is a perfectly legitimate concept. It is biblical because when people are told to repent, it is because they are sinning. That's what Simon was told. That's what in Acts 17 they're told. And then, and then Acts 2 is exactly that. I think that's the point of connecting it. Peter said, repent and, let me say, repent and each of you, and by the way, he is talking to them as Jews, but it's also the individuals that get saved individually. Because it even stresses the individuals when it shifts to the third person. Repent, plural, that's the verb, it's a plural verb, and each of you individually be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness. Repentance and baptism here, just because it's an act of faith and repentance, is connected to forgiveness of sins. So you can't separate repentance uh, from salvation because that's what the forgiveness of sins is. That's why they're that's why they're told to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. They had killed him. Now they must turn of that sin from that sin, be baptized in his name, meaning you must now pledge yourself to him if you want to get forgiveness, which is salvation. And that's given to individual Jews, not it doesn't matter whether it's the nation as a whole, it's the individuals that say repentance is certainly necessary, and I think demonstrated by those texts. But it is not it is not something other than grace. All right. Well, I think I have time to introduce a last question within the 30 minute window. Uh, and again, it's a question for both of you. LA91 asks the question for both how does James 2 harmonize with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and Romans 11, 6? And if I, for my editorialization, I think the person has in mind the part about James 2, which says, you see that not by faith only you're justified, but by works, but compare that with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Romans 11, 6, which says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And uh, last time Tommy went first, so AK, I guess this time uh, makes sense for you to go first. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I got videos that relate to these topics. Uh, yeah, I think this is a good question and very relatable to the context too, or our, I mean the debate, because it's the same problem a lot of people have, and, and, I, and it's not just free grace, it, it's all kinds of people. This problem of every text they see that talks about works and faith and obedience or something, they always think it's always talking about the same thing. Paul spends a lot of time talking about, as he does in Ephesians 2 and Romans 11 there, that justification, salvation is not through works, it is through faith. So in these contexts, and Paul makes it clear, if you read through the context what he's talking about, he's saying salvation cannot be merited by your conduct, by your obedience, because your obedience would need to be perfect which somehow Tommy thinks that uh, I, I, that's exactly what I'm teaching you must do, which shows he hasn't understood my position at all. But no, if you are going to be justified by your conduct, it must be flawless. Nobody is, so nobody can be justified through their works. Nobody can merit, merit, because grace is the opposite of merit. In Ephesians chapter 2, and it says, by grace you are saved, not through works. When it says not through works, it means the opposite of grace. If grace is unmerited favor, then the opposite, the contrast, the juxtaposition is works, meaning you haven't earned it by your works. These are conducts to show people that they don't deserve this. This is God's love, his mercy. But what people have to understand is in James 2, he's not talking about the basis of salvation, whether you merit it or not, or if it's too fact. That's not what his point is. In James 2, it's a different context. He's talking about what kind of faith justifies, which is what I've been talking about. He's not talking about whether you can merit it through works. He's talking about whether the faith that justifies is this faith that doesn't lead to works, and he says it is not. You can't be justified that way, because that's the kind of faith the devils have. They acknowledge facts, but, they're, but, they're, but they don't trust in Jesus. That's not the kind of faith they have. And so what he's saying is uh, the faith that justifies is the faith that works, and in the same context in James 2, Paul mentions, or James mentions love. And, that, and in fact, that's what the chapter has all been about. Chapter 1 and 2 is about love. Paul says the same thing. Faith that works through love is the only thing that means something. Galatians 5, 6. They're actually very consistent. 
That's that's mine. And Tommy, you get the uh, final answer on this. Yeah, well, let me just say, if I hope I didn't give the idea that I think AK's position teaches that you know one must be sinless and perfect based on some of these things he said, I believe he has greatly lowered the standard. I believe Lordship Salvation greatly lowers the standard to the point of making void the law of God. Free grace is what establishes the law. So um, I just, I just want to make sure I, I clear that up right there too. And then also too, when it comes to uh, back to the surrender thing, I think one part of AK's problem where the confusion is, is he is associating my free grace position with your average free grace YouTuber. I read the definition in the very beginning of free grace that I said represents what I believe. And it did not say in there, you do not have to surrender. We just have a very different, different definition of what surrendering is. And uh, his lowers the standard. Mine keeps it, um, you know, where it should be. But in James chapter two, um, what this is showing, this, this justification it's talking about, I believe it's showing that um, we're justified to others by our works. People can't see our faith without our works. It, the chapter starts out, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. And it starts talking about how we are with other people and how we behave with other people. And it uses Abraham as a great example, how he was justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac. Well, that's not when he got saved. He got saved years before when God told him he was going to multiply his seed as the stars of heaven. But when he did that great act of faith, that was that was a great testimony of not just somebody who got saved, but somebody who had faith and trusted God in great ways. And so not only are we saved by grace through faith, but God wants us to live by faith too. God wants us to display our faith to the world so we can be a good testimony to them. And if we, as free grace people and many free grace people, they have faith and they might even be saved, but they don't have works and they're a terrible testimony. They are an embarrassment to the true gospel of Christ. And I would say that many of the many, many free gracers in the YouTube world, I think are a huge embarrassment because they have no works and their their works speak something very different than what the what the Bible teaches and uh, and what a shame that is when we have that. But you know what? James had to tell these people, you know, don't be that way because we can be that way. And often many saved people are. Now you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> self-muted all right so uh i i know that people have limited time for the uh just to continue answering questions but uh and we've now passed the 30 minute mark so i leave it up to you if you if you both tell me immediately <laughs> that you want to keep going i'll keep going otherwise i think i'll just uh, offer you guys the opportunity for your final words and final thoughts on this debate, uh, I, I, it was not specifically on my outline, so if that shouldn't be there, I apologize. But I assume that's the the usual procedure. Yeah, I leave it up to Tommy. He may want to. Uh, yeah, no, I probably better shut it down because I could go on yeah. forever doing these things. We probably better <laughs> shut it down. I th I think we've both got our positions in for sure. Yep. Okay. Well, I, I suppose then. Uh, Tommy can uh, give his farewell or his, you know, some closing remarks that he'd like to make. Yeah. So again, um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this debate is because I do, I believe that the free grace position um, is horribly represented on the internet by people looking for attention, constantly exposing everybody, constantly exposing other free gracers and all that. But, as embarrassing as free grace people often are, there's no doubt that the uh, the definition that I, I read to you is accurate. It is what I believe, and it's what the Bible teaches. Salvation truly is free. And lordship salvation, as displayed tonight, is another example of lowering God's standard and making void the law of God. Free grace is what establishes a law. 
it shows every single bit of it is important. God does not lower his standard for anyone. He's holy. He cannot do that. And that is why salvation is based completely on the work of Christ. God can only accept a holy offering. And to think that our reformation that hopefully we have is somehow even that is pleasing to a holy God is just to not know God at all. But what God, but understand free grace is not a call to lawlessness. It's not a call to, to wickedness. No free grace and that goodness of God. That's what leads us to repentance. That's what motivates us. Because again, when I look at that holy, perfect law of God, I recognize that I can't do it. But when I see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he did, I know that even in this sorry flesh and in my sorry condition, if I will do my best and if I will, if I will from the heart try to please the Lord, even though nothing I can do is satisfactory to holy God, if I will do it by faith, then I can please I can please him. And I, but and if I, but if I judge what I do by the law, I'm always going to come short. But I'm able to judge. But God is able, judges me by what I do through faith and that grace that Jesus Christ did. It makes up for all my shortcomings, and and I'm and I'm so thankful for that. And so when it comes to that free grace thing, a lot of people use it as an excuse to sin and live lawless and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, that is not what we should be doing with this teaching and shame on people who live that way and take advantage of the grace of God, how wicked that is. And if you are a child of God, I believe he's going to whoop the fire out of you for doing that kind of thing. And you're not going to be effective in bringing people to Christ. If you live that way, you will regret it and you will suffer on this earth. If you are a child of God, he will chastise you. And, um, you know, we need to be, we need to be better than that. But the Lordship Salvation crowd, while again, while it sounds good in a lot of ways, um, it lowers the standard. It takes the focus off Christ. <clears throat> it steals joy. And I think we need to keep the gospel where it is. And when we have these free grace, you know, losers out there who just refuse to get their act together, you know what we do? We put them out of the church. There's a lot of free grace people out there on the internet that would not be allowed in our church because well, if I might jump in, Tommy, uh, I should have clarified closing remarks is more like, you know, thank you. you oh, know, I'm sorry. Know. I thought we were supposed to do like a five minute closing. Well, that was a, uh, yeah, that was before the audience Q and a, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, about that. <clears throat> well, that's all right. Uh, since all that was said, let me just say, and I'm going to make this very brief just because I, I can't help. I have to say something there at the end. Yeah. I don't believe Lordship lowers the standard. It makes Jesus the standard and said that he must he must be surrendered to. I mean, the free grace theology that says you can be saved without submitting, which is the whole point of this debate, that can't be agreed to, otherwise the debate wouldn't happen. I think that lowers the standard and says his law, his authority isn't so significant that yeah, you could be saved without it. I don't think it lowers the standard. I think it does just the opposite. It makes Jesus the standard. And it makes salvation what it's supposed to be about him. But but I don't want to say too much. Otherwise, we just keep going on. But uh, I will say, uh, I do appreciate you, Tommy, coming on. And uh, I want to say to everybody, again, just keep you know, Donnie, who's always, is it, it great to be on Donnie's program and do these debates, but keep him in your prayers. Um, I do want to say, Turton fan, I want to let you say, if you have any Thing you'd like to say in farewell since you've been gracious enough to moderate for us uh if you want to point anybody once again to some of your channels if you got one i mean you you have some closing remarks to say no, uh, thanks very much for asking me to uh fill in for donnie uh this evening and, and to moderate this debate between you i appreciate the uh the civility of the debate and not not having to have me try to shout over anybody or anything like that. I do, uh, I I do enjoy listening and, and hearing both sides. Of course, this is the part where I declare a winner. Uh, just kidding, of course. Uh, but in all seriousness, I I'm glad that we have an opportunity to study God's word and to hear uh, two men ex, uh, expound on God's word and, and explain it. And uh, uh, definitely, I hope that the audience as well has been blessed by this. And it sounds like. 
uh, where we left it in these closing uh, comments, there's room for future debates between you uh, both. So I will look forward to listening to that when the time comes. All right. Thanks a lot, Kurt and Fan. Now, Tommy, you and I will debate. And I will say once again that Tommy and I will do the original subject when we reschedule it on Donnie's program. And I look forward to that. I appreciate it. Uh, I, re really, thank you for coming on, Tommy. Uh, I think it was a beneficial debate. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And Turt and Fanny did great. I appreciate you coming and doing this for us. Thanks. Uh, I do appreciate all the audience. Uh, look for uh, future details to come out as far, and it'll be soon when our debate on Once Saved, Always Saved will be rescheduled. Uh, I will be posting stuff. I'm sure Tommy will too. So good night and God bless.